Hello, everybody, and welcome to Break the Rules. As always, I am your host, Lev Polyakov, a.k.a. Lev po on Twitter, and it is a pleasure to be here tonight to uh, talk with someone who wrote such an amazing, such an inspiring book called The Cold Vanish, Seeking the Missing in North America's Wildlands. We have with, here, with us here today the great John Billman. Thank you so much for coming in, John. I really appreciate it. And we've also got some uh, newcomers to the stream, Culture Barbar, from all the way from Norway. And as always, we have Outlaw Prime, Weird Hiker, Yakov, and we're going to have a lot more uh, folks coming in to uh, talk with John. So anyway, John, we're going to get to a lot of stuff. We're going to talk about the uh, Utah monolith. We're going to talk about cryptids. Oh, but right. first, I want to ask you about your uh, former occupation as a wildlife firefighter. I, uh, I read that and I was like, man, that is, that is quite something. How did, you, how did you get to that position? Yeah, well, I started as an undergrad at college as just a way to you know, pay the bills. And um, I was stationed, I'm, I'm originally from uh, the Black Hills of South Dakota. And I was stationed out there in Leeds, South Dakota, and with, uh, with the South Dakota uh, D State Division of Forestry. And um, we traveled all over. And uh, um, it's just, you know, it's one of those, it's one of those jobs that's really, really physically demanding, but, but I, I love it. And um, Part of me wishes I was still out there. Um, you know, it's a it's a it's a dangerous career now with the with climate change and what's what you, know, you see in California. But um, I, it's you know it's uh, it's a it's a lucrative job right now. I've got some friends that still do it, and um, yeah, I, I kind of went the academic track, and then yeah, part of my heart wishes I was still out there. <laughs> Do you notice that, uh, and this is just an aside as far as uh, controlled fires go, F from what I read, I don't know if this is uh, the case, that uh, a lot of these fires could have been prevented by controlled fires early on, but those don't really happen for some weird bureaucratic re re reason in certain areas. Absolutely, that's true. And, you know, they, they call it the urban um, urban wildland interface, and that just that's just a fancy term for... Uh, people are building too many expensive homes in places they don't belong. And that, and that's where the, the politics come in. They don't want the controlled fires. And, um, you know, a lot of, you know, for years and years and years, Smokey Bear uh, mission was to put out every fire when you know, some of these really remote fires should have been left to burn. Like they, they, they did uh, a couple hundred years ago. So, so you've got this, this tremendous fuel buildup. Um, and then you get some drought and some uh, some big winds and you've got problems. Definitely. And uh, we also have Torchbear. Speaking of fires, we have Torchbear coming into the stream as well, uh, joining us here. Welcome, Torchbear. And by the way, guys, for all the new people who are watching this, don't forget to subscribe. And for all the subscribers, don't forget to click the bell and also go to patreon.com slash break the rules. Guys, I already sent out the first beautiful magnets that my father father alexander polyakov created i know aman sadhu he wrote a post about these magnets he is very happy with uh with what he got he got a custom magnet actually so for those who bring in 50 dollars as a patron you are going to get a completely custom magnet whatever you want my father is going to make it for you out of wood this is real good quality wood unfortunately john i wish you could see this this is on another screen but let me just read aman's uh note here about these magnets before uh, before we move on aman said the following yo i got the magnet and car today is very nice thank you the detail on the wood is quite stunning and the wood grain itself is as beautiful as a beautiful fretboard on a beautiful guitar i'm not sure what fretboards on a guitar are unfortunately i am not a musically inclined person but for those who know what that is i'm sure that's uh i'm sure that's a good thing where you put your fingers man where the pressure goes ah okay very very good i'm, I'm very happy to hear that i'm on and again guys become a patron help us grow i really appreciate everything that you have been putting into this and also let me turn on the stream labs and the d live notifications so we make sure we get them so anyway john when it comes to the people who disappear every year from these forests and national parks in your book you wrote that the number that was listed was a very very conservative number what would the number be that you would uh, place as being closer to the truth well i get i get in trouble Lev, when i talk the math here um and um that, the, the, the truth is nobody knows. Nobody knows. I mean, you know, the Park Service will give you a number. The Forest Service, I, don't, I doubt that they would give you a number. 
um, you know, the, the reason is it's, it's, it's the bureaucracy and it's, um, you know, the, the park service itself functions sort of like a, like sovereign countries. And, um, then you've got, then you've got the department of agriculture, which runs the, uh, us forest service. And that's another, um, giant, uh, land management entity. And, but if you go missing, the chances are you're going to be in, um, under the jurisdiction of your local, your county sheriff's department. And so um, they're going to give you other numbers too. It's just uh, the math is fuzzy wherever you go. It's, it, it's perhaps a little less fuzzy in Canada, but it's still fuzzy up there. Um, people, just, people just are not keeping track of, of who goes missing when, um, when it's outside of an urban area. I've heard you say that some of these locales are much better at keeping track than others, and some do a much better job in searches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. And so let's say let's say you go missing outside of Vail, Colorado. That's a that's a very wealthy county um, with a with a crack uh, search and rescue, uh, not just team, but but different organizations are going to come going to come try to find you. Um, but then let's say you go missing in, in, a, in a, one of the poor counties in Southern Colorado. And um, uh, I, I researched a story down there and, and some of the search and rescue personnel, I mean, their heart's definitely in the right place and they're dedicating their time and, and, and most of the time their money. Uh, and this is what they do. But I, it's, you know, sometimes um, a lost person is dependent on somebody's old truck starting, literally. Um, I, I had someone tell me that, um, and then, you know, it takes a long time to get resources from, from outside the area to come in. So, so it, it, it's definitely, it's definitely a Russian roulette, uh, when you go missing. And you were describing people having gone missing, including, uh, Jacob, who was, I guess, the uh, main character of the book, uh, having gone up the elevation and certain people you said uh like to go down and others like to go up you were attributing more of a spiritual reason sometimes why they would go up and also talked about how some of the people who went up there is like they haven't found any remains whatsoever of them and that brings up another question and i guess these are two paths that we can go on like the more let's say practical path of you know they got eaten by a bear or hypothermia or any of that and then going into the more uh you know uh i guess the more romantic i'm not sure what the best way to call it uh you know I, I think here there there are definitely the two paths to choose but before any of that i think the most important thing that john your work seems to focus on is humanizing these people and that's what you kind of don't get from david polites and i think that's probably where we should start could you could you tell us about jacob gray and what led him to his scenario Sure, sure. And, and David Pilates does important work. I, I would like the opportunity to say that, you know, what I mean, his data collection is, is really impressive. But yeah, that's what, you know, and, and I read all his books, which were which are fascinating. Um, but right, so I, I guess that's a good point. I, I've always been more interested in the, I guess, the other side of the of the story, which is the people who are there left to try to figure out what the hell happened to someone who's gone missing. And so, that's that's kind of my my focus and my start and so um and a lot of times as you can imagine and, and i i think i say this in the book but i'm i'm really i was really leery um i did not want to be an ambulance chaser and and I, i'm really aware of of the pain that these families are going through and just the shock and the um just the, the stress on the families and so um Jacob, I, I, maybe I should maybe I should uh, back up a little bit and talk about Jacob's situation. But um, I, I, I'm a freelance writer and I work for different magazines. And a magazine called Bicycling um, hired me to go uh, research the the story of Jacob Gray because Jacob Gray was a, a cyclist. He was a touring cyclist, and he was preparing for a self supported cross country trek from Washington State to Vermont. And um, his gear, his bike and his gear was found inside Olympic National Park in Washington State along the Soul Duck River. And um, that sort of started the story. And uh, but what was unique about it? Well, a lot of things were unique about it. But for me, um, what was special about that case was Randy Gray, Jacob's father. Uh, Jacob was a 22 year old young man. 
Um, and, and so, uh, I called his father and, and he just, he just embraced me immediately, which is really, um, and most people are, 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 are rightly so suspicious when it comes to the media. And I think they should be, um, it's yeah, the there's a, right there's here. A, that's great. Yeah. Do you think and, that possibly he was excited that you, that there was just an, you know, another angle trying to figure out what was going on? Well, I think that's a good point. I think I think he looked at me for um, as another set of eyeballs that could help. Like I yeah. think I think um, hey, here's another here's another person. You know, at so, pretty quickly, and that's the theme in the book is is you know the the authorities, the official search search ends pretty quickly. Um, they just don't have the resources to um, to keep searching for someone forever, and so they 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 cut the cord. Oh, sometimes it's a few days, sometimes it's a couple weeks, but they cut the cord pretty quickly. And after that, Randy was like, Hey, here's somebody interested in my son. Uh, come on out. And, um, you know, he punched me in the arm and, and gave me a bear hug the first time I met him. I, you know, I, I felt like I'd known him for, for my whole life. He's that kind of person. <laughs> He's a very and, uh, glass half full kind of guy. Absolutely. The glass is, is, is flowing over even when his son is missing. It's, I've never met anybody quite like him, you know? And so, um, that started this journey for me. And he went to Japan originally, and uh, then he started this halfway house uh, for uh, you know people who had various problems in their life. So uh, he definitely seemed like a very, uh, very giving person. And his son was also like, from what I read, like his son got very interested in uh, Christianity, I guess alluding to Jacob of uh, you know, the bib biblical Jacob as well as Infowars and things of that nature. So uh, I know, like, I think a lot of people now are also going through this uh, transformation where they're curious about what exactly uh, lies uh, lies beyond that. And I think his father as well, contacting, like, the psychics and the the woman who fed the uh, Bigfoot, you know, like that. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting, the kind of characters you end up meeting along the way. But uh, where do you personally... Uh, stand when it comes to how much are you willing to accept a lot of these different uh, occurrences that spring up i know the psychics weren't doing that well at all when it came to their uh, you know the conclusions they drew yeah so so i think well i think about this a lot lev um and and i think i think what i do have on the other side of the book is is a larger sense of humility when it comes to um, let's say Bigfoot um, um, enthusiast, right? So I, I, I don't know that I was a, a pure skeptic going into it, but I, but I, you know, I, I had, I had a lot of doubts when it comes to Bigfoot and, and um, you know, it's, it's funny with Bigfoot because um, so I, I flew into Seattle. I caught the ferry across to the Olympic Peninsula. I hadn't talked to another, another person yet until I get to um, Olympic National Park, essentially. And, and the closest, so you've got, you've got the Soul Duck River, you've got the Soul Duck River Road. That's where Jacob rode his bike up the mountain, left his bike and gear between the road and the river. It was really strange because it wasn't, he didn't try to hide things very well. It wasn't, it wasn't camouflaged so that yeah, um, no, so no, no one would, um, would mess with this stuff. So, so literally, okay, you've got the park entrance and yeah, that's a good photo. You've got the park entrance and the closest private property right across the highway 101 from Olympic national park is, is this property. And uh, we came to calling it the Bigfoot barn. And the reason it's called the Bigfoot barn is it's uh, I guess it's sort of a home base for um, these very, very um, uh, legitimate Bigfoot researchers. And, and um, some of them have been on the cable shows and things, and um, you might recognize some of them. But, but what's interesting about them, so, so I'm, I'm coming in here kind of blind and like, okay, cool. The Bigfoot people are letting me camp in their, on their property. They're, um, they're letting me use their shower, use their, their kitchen facility, use their maps um use their food um i mean they're just open they literally opened up their barn for for randy and then um and then to me as well and and so they um 
they didn't they didn't make they didn't make the search for Jacob about Bigfoot. They made it about Jacob, and they they were out there every chance they could get. Um, they were out there in the mountains. And nobody knows those mountains better than they do. And they were in the mountains, and they were they were searching, and they were helping to to plan tomorrow's search and strategizing where he could be. And um, they were intrepid and, and pretty much did not give up looking for the year and a half that that he was missing. And so, so how can you not respect that kind of effort? And 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 how can you dismiss um, dismiss their research and their beliefs? And and by the way, some of the stories they would tell about Bigfoot. Uh, you know, at night after we get in from searching, um, you know, it would raise the hair on the back of your neck. It's, it's yeah. So I, uh, I went from being doubtful to being um, to just having a lot of uh, humility and respect when it comes to Bigfoot. And it's something where I think people find themselves in the position that they could help other people. And it really does bring out the best in you where you're able to do that. Like, if more people were in that kind of situation today, I think there'd be a lot less outrage online for stupid things that don't matter at the end of the day. And I guess outside exposure to the air also uh, also helps. But at the same time, like, um, now this is getting a little bit on the side territory, but I also think it's related to what we're talking about. We had a conversation before I spoke with Arian Cowboy, talking to him about uh, he lives around the uh, Cascade Mountain area close to uh, Portland, Oregon. And he, like, I asked him, like, why is it that, like, Olympia and uh, Washington and Portland, Oregon, these are areas where you have a lot of Antifa people and they cause, you know, they cause a lot of chaos and a lot of trouble there. He talked about how much the environment itself, this forest environment, how there is a lot of spiritual activity, like nature spirits, things of that nature, that would in a way sometimes be too much for people to handle. And in a way, like, some people can... Go, grow stronger and other people would kind of succumb to it and it harkens back to uh the idea of shamans why shamans wear the masks where they wear these you know ooga booga type masks in order to scare the nature spirits because the nature spirits like they're animal spirits mostly like they're not they're not going to tell the difference they're they're going to be scared by the masks so it's an interesting environmental factor spiritually speaking that i don't think a lot of people have considered who have come into these areas like i'm from new york i was from st petersburg russia before hopefully i'll move to somewhere closer to nature soon but uh Right now, like, how much do you think this is more of just uh, something to occupy people's minds with versus something that you may have personally experienced or your friends have experienced, the power of the woods to affect people in such a way? Yeah, I, I, I think that's a big, a, a big thing. I, I know, like, look, looking, at, looking at Randy Gray and Jacob Gray, and those two were, are just fueled by, by being outside. I mean, they just... Um, it's funny, you know, Randy, Randy's in his sixties and, and he, um, I mean, he would just, he would just curl up and sleep under a tree at night, you know, and just, and just sort of, uh, thrive on that. I mean, discomfort wasn't really a, it wasn't in his vocabulary, you know, and just, um, uh, the ocean, he called it getting ionized. He was, their, their families are, they're keen surfers and, um, we're really expert level surfers. I'm, I'm like fish in the water. Unbelievable to watch them. And, um, he would just, uh, I mean, he literally, we'd smell the ocean out there and we would, he just, we, we'd drive straight to the beach and he'd just go walk up and down the coast just to sort of get fueled by, by that outside air. And, um, I, no, I, I think, I think you're onto something. And for the rest of you guys, have you experienced uh, similar things as well? And before you answer that, we have a $5 donation. $5 donation uh, from Nord Ball Gang, who says, uh, longtime fan of Culture Barbar, who I also want to get to because he is a newcomer here. Uh, longtime fan of Culture Barbar chipping in to show my support. Also, could Mr. Barbar please confirm or deny whether or not the man known as Lore Horm is in fact a twink? <laughs> I have no idea what they're talking yeah, about. Uh, uh, he is uh, he's a twink. <laughs> okay good and by the uh, way could you tell us just uh, just a bit about yourself yeah uh i'm a culture barbarian uh in norwegian uh i'm i write uh and i uh, live like uh 50 meters uh next to uh some woods here uh i have 
<laughs> and have you experienced have you yeah. experienced a similar thing uh, of what we were talking about just now? That power and majesty of the woods that can overtake somebody. Oh, uh, I've been. Uh, I have had lots of thoughts about the the Stendhal syndrome, with uh, where uh, art, uh, great art, like just takes your breath away and leaves you incapacitated almost. I've had uh, that experience in uh, in nature uh, uh, quite a lot of times. Uh, I sat uh, under the uh, Galopigen, it's the biggest mountain in Norway. Uh, sat at night just looking up towards the peak and uh, felt myself uh, almost in a trance. I couldn't uh, I couldn't move for uh, I don't know how long I sat there. I'm looking it up right now. It looks like a very, uh, very beautiful mountain. And were you there during the summertime or wintertime? I'm not quite sure. Uh, so, uh, summertime. Uh, but it's still uh, ice uh, all over there. And uh, uh, I always pictured it uh, to be um, just a straight mountain. But it's uh, huge rocks all over the place. So it's uh, very inhospitable uh quite difficult to get around and have you seen the polar uh what would you call it the uh, northern lights as well ah no i uh, i've never never had a chance one day that would be a definitely a dream of mine to go and look at them uh, oh, yeah. john have you had the pleasure of seeing them yeah we we have them here and um um, not long ago, I was I so I I commute to my job in town. I live out out in the woods, and um, I commute on on a bicycle. And I a lot of times I come home after dark. And um, yeah, not long ago I was riding home, and and um, just sort of this green, this green light just just enveloped me. And um, it took me a minute to realize, oh wait a minute, this is Northern Lights. And so, um, they're pretty special. Yeah. Well, speaking of green lights, this is another thing that I heard about Bigfoot, that Bigfoot could actually be a tulpa. What I mean by a tulpa is a spiritual projection of other beings who may not look exactly like F Bigfoot does, but uh, kind of retain the idea of this Bigfoot character being a good lure to grab people with. And, you know, some people say it's vampires, like these big Nephilim mm. type, uh, you know, uh, people who have uh, existed for a long time and feasted on other people and animals and just hid themselves away. And maybe they think that most humans still look like the uh, Bigfoot. So Bigfoot is kind of like their projection of what a human looks like and why the stories talk about Bigfoot being followed by a uh, green light that could be, in a way, how they're able to project this spectral image to the people who are mm. watching it. And there were some stories I remember in your book. You talked about uh, some people being led by like a nymph, by a sexy, sexy looking lady and, uh, you know, other creatures of that sort. So I'm curious if you had any experiences when it comes to that. Well, you know, um, the closest I, I got, Lev, was when we were at the base of Mount Rainier. And, and what happened was, and, and, you know, if someone goes missing, um, you know, through social media, uh, people come out of the woodwork, uh, I guess, pun intended. Um, and. And so this uh, Native American woman uh, near Mount Rainier contacted, contacted um, Jacob's sister and Jacob's sister contacted Randy and said, hey, um, there's a woman up in Mount Rainier that, that feeds a family of Bigfoot. Um, you know, I think you should at least talk to her. And one of the things you find yourself um, responding to when someone close to you goes missing is, is you know, once you're... Um, once the, the your leads have all sort of played out and you just don't know where to turn, you'll you'll listen to to everybody. And so um, so Randy said, "Come on, we're gonna go. We're gonna go talk to this woman, and 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 she's gonna take us out, and um, she's gonna feed the Bigfoot and um, the family of Bigfoot." And uh, and that, and we did. We went out and uh, middle of the night, and she took donuts from the the local gas station, and um, she she communicated with, with the family of Bigfoot. I, I can't say that I, I, I met them or saw them, but, um, were you tempted to put a hidden camera somewhere? I, you know, that's the thing. My, my neighbors all have game cameras or trail cameras, you know? And, um, I, I think, I think your, your, 
your hunches on Bigfoot being something other than um, sort of a corporal manifestation like a human body, I, I think might be closer to it. Otherwise, I think my neighbors would have captured Bigfoot on their trail camera. You said that she communicated with it. What does that mean? Is that a telepathic thing? Did you hear the the samurai chatter or whatever? She, okay, so she would, she would, she would turn to us and say, and, and it's dark, but she would turn to us and, and inter- interpret what she was hearing or or what she was communicating with the family. And but so, you heard nothing. I heard nothing. I heard nothing. And I'm not. And I'm not gonna. I'm not passing judgment on sure. her. You know, um, she's she's much closer. She's much closer to to that to that realm than I am. But um, but it was a really interesting experience because I, I I can tell you one thing. She you know, um, she believes it. She believes it. I wanted to ask you, John, about, they mentioned, um, Lev just mentioned women yeah. drawing people into the woods. Uh, and that's something that I know a fellow who was in Iceland um, and he had an experience where he, f- he had this very, very vivid image of a woman, a beautiful woman, um, an Icelandic woman, really, uh, deep in the woods that he had to he got in his head to go there and find her and he was just walking deeper and deeper until eventually he just realized what the fuck am I doing you know he, he was like this is insane this is so it was afterwards that he'd by chance stumbled across um, Icelandic folklore about that about the these uh, women who would lure people into the woods and a lot of cases of men being uh, getting lost and not coming back um, would be linked to that folklore. So it's it's interesting. Uh, I haven't seen what you've written about that or if you have or anything, but I'd like to, you know, within a, an American context, you know, is that is that something that you think um, is prominent part of kind of folklore when it comes to getting lost in the woods, being drawn in by a woman? You know, that's I, I, maybe somebody else could could help with responding to that because I, th- I think it's fascinating. And I, uh, you know, wow, I, I don't know. I was <laughs> I, I, I got caught in a, one time in Wyoming. When I was younger. I got caught. I was in the, I was in the mountains. I was I was camping by myself and I, I got caught in a, in a really bad lightning storm, like the kind of lightning storm where you think this is a horrible idea. I've got a pretty good chance of getting struck by lightning here. And mm. um and a beautiful woman picked me up in an old pickup truck that was out of time. Like it was, you know, this truck was like from the forties or something and and this old rusty pickup truck. And so she gave me a ride back to my campsite. And um, it was odd because it it was really dark on this, this, this mountain road. And she, she kind of had a sense of where it was. And so um, I don't know, I'm not saying that's anything sort of other real, but large uh, Marge for some reason reminds me (laughs) of, uh, (laughs) For those, for those who don't know, it was from Pee Wee's Big Adventure. He got into a truck, Pee Wee Herman, uh, and there was this, uh, you know, butch uh, driver, Large Marge, who died. My favorite part was when she turned to him, and there was that animation. I'm gonna try to find it and put it in the chat right now. I just love it. It's such a, it's such a classic. But there are stories. I don't know about Iceland. I'm sure Iceland has the same thing. But in the book that I was reading, which I highly recommend to everybody to read. Oh man, we got a three dollar donation. Uh, the that Thale is a documentary about Huldra. I also invite you all to my cabin up in northern Norway. Look at that. Thank I'll you so there. much. I'll be there. I yes. really appreciate uh, who, who it. Who said so, that again? What, what was his name? I, so, I think I know who he is. Agdur King. Does everybody ah, in yes. Norway kind of just know each other? <laughs> <laughs> I imagine it's really close-knit. <laughs> Uh, no, not really. It's too too vast country. I'm gonna bring them all together and the Swedes, because we got Alexander Bard bringing in the Swedish people to BTR. I'm gonna bring in the Norwegians on. We got a, uh, you know, we're we're bringing in everybody. But anyway, uh, there is a book I highly recommend everybody to read. It's called Daimonic Reality by Patrick Harper. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this uh, book, but it details a lot of these stories about demons fairies ufos all the spectral phenomena and a very interesting thing that caught my uh, eye about it was how they were describing the demons and their er, fairies actually fairies in ireland where the fairies in ireland they weren't small they were actually like big they were like six 
six foot, very beautiful looking like god godlike people. And uh, it's a very interesting way to think about the uh, supernatural as opposed to like hairy beings or like dwarves or like little fairies with the wings. And that may be kind of like some of these nymphs, some of these sedu seductresses bringing uh, certain hapless men in there. Although those mm. may not actually be that beautiful. That may be a disguise to hide their claws and, you know, who knows what else they're going to do with that poor dude who gets, uh, who gets subdued by their, uh, by their attractiveness. But you guys, like Yakov, you do a show. This is your time to plug, by the way. You do a Ooh. show, Skinwalker Tapes, where you talk about a lot of these different, uh, different sightings. What, what would be like the most extreme thing that you have personally encountered that you could share uh, with uh, John and the rest of us? Uh, the most extreme thing. That's hard to say. And here's the thing. I, yes, I do a show, Skinwalker Tapes. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Skinwalker Tapes, and you can see the live show at dlive.tv slash Yakov Alive. And we can also be found on Exodus Americanus with many other great shows, and you should check it out. Uh, I've done a lot of research into people disappearing into, into the woods. There's, there's the staircases in the woods, which are kind of silly, but maybe we could get into there. There are, there's all the Bigfoot stuff, but honestly, there's nothing more terrifying than going into the woods. It's broad daylight and you think, you know what you're doing. And suddenly you get turned around and every tree looks exactly the same and you have no idea where you are. And you think you're going to be lost there forever. And thank God I found my way out, but I think that's the scariest thing really. I would agree with that. But then I, you hear other stories, things kind of related to Faye. Like there's this old story about a disappearance in the woods. That's one of my favorites. A, a young boy goes into the woods to, to play, do whatever he's doing. While he's out there, a man comes upon him. And it's a very kind looking man. And he says, hey, you, you were, you've been out here doing your thing all day. Come back, take a break, come play with my kids. We're going to have dinner. Come spend some time with my family. And they walk through the woods and they go back to his cabin. And he's there. There's some kids playing. There's there's a beautiful looking dinner on the table. He sees a family friend there visiting these people who are otherwise a stranger to him. Uh, everything goes well. The dinner's great. He ends up spending the night. When they wake up the next morning, uh, he's told by the man, "We're going to take you back. We're going to take you back to uh, to where I found you, and then you can you can head on your way." So they're going back, and as they're traveling. The boy is seeing the most beautiful countryside he's ever seen in his life. And he feels like he's so close to where he lived, where he came from, but he doesn't recognize anything. He has no idea where he is. And it's that moment where he realized that. And as he gets back to where he was, he, he, he gets back, he heads home. He tells his family about this who have no idea what he's talking about. He actually sees that family friend and asks and mentions that night to them. It turns out they say they were not there at all. And there's there's really no explanation for this, and it's usually lumped in with Faye stories. Mm. Mm. Very wow. very interesting. And how about uh, yourself, a weird hiker? You've uh, hiked in a lot of weird places, probably. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've spent a lot of time in the Sierras. Um, I have never had any explicitly weird experiences. Um, as far as supernatural, you know, occurrences and entities and whatnot. Um, I mean, I, I can say that, you know, at, when you're exhausted and you're at altitude and stuff, it's not, I mean, you know, people will say, oh, you know, you, you're starting to feel a little different. You're starting to having, you know, these different experiences. They're, you know, they're going to say it's just physiological and whatnot, but I, I don't really believe that. I mean, every time I go really high up, and I'm, you know, going over a pass or something, you know, coming up into a, you know, sometimes you'll, 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 you'll get up into these areas where you're, you're in a low Valley and you kind of get up into this big bench type area. That's like a higher, you know, like kind of like a, like a Mesa in between a bunch of other mountains. And you kind of feel like you've just entered into this weird zone. That's just not really a part of anything else. And you just kind of feel like there's huge, I don't know. You just look at the at the rocks and the peaks, and you just sort of you can't help but feel like there's something huge living underneath them. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I I get lost in daydreams all the time, just thinking about what what there could be. Just if if I could take a a cross section of a mountain, you know, and look at what's on the inside. 
Well, and, nature uh, is how man has to go out and conquer. Like this is what men dream about: going and building exactly, their own yeah. cabin in the woods and searching, searching their property, knowing every inch of it. And mm. it's the last place a man can really go out. And you can go out on a hike, you know, today, and it, it's beautiful. And you know, you might you might even get spooked along the way. But the thing is, there's always danger there, even if you're only going like seven miles out in the woods. And just to know that that danger is there, and hopefully it's only a little bit. Don't you know? Don't overemphasize it. But that in itself, it, it fills something. Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, just on my last trip, I, I only got it was my first time going into um, fresh snow, and um, I only made it about four miles um, because uh, I was actually going into a place called Desolation Wilderness. I don't know if you have any of you have heard of it, but it's a very popular uh, location in the northern Sierra. Um, in the summertime, you can get in really easy. But right after snow, if you're not well prepared, which I wasn't really, I didn't have snowshoes or anything, you know, it's very difficult. So I'm going through, I'm waist high snow a lot of times. There's no path to follow. I'm just sort of going towards the boundary. I'm getting way too tired to decide to call it and just set up camp for a night, even though I'm not in a legal area yet. And I'm, you know, absolutely exhausted that night. Um, my feet got too wet. So I was trying to warm my feet up and, uh, I was just, you know, I was, I was a little dehydrated because um, I was just not really uh, prioritizing my task quick enough. And I started hearing all these coyotes around me um, yipping okay. and barking and, yeah, and howling. And I mean, it's such a, it's so hard to describe, but just it's, those are a lot of fairly banal things. Like just, if you just take one thing, like just hearing coyotes, I mean, for a city slicker, sure. That might be like exciting, but you know, you hear coyotes all the time. You get tired all the time. You get dehydrated all the time. All those are a bunch of little small common things. How about being in the woods? You're walking your little dog. You're high on mushrooms and you hear the coyotes. (laughs) They're definitely hunting my dog. (laughs) Well, yeah, that's what I was wondering is, I mean, it was me and my girlfriend out there and I was like, you know, I wonder if they're thinking about us right now. I wonder if they're, if, because you know, they were all around us. I could, I would hear the calls, you know, 200 feet North and then an hour later, they'd be South of us a hundred feet. They're, they're, you know, freaking looking around. I wonder if they're just talking about us or whatever, trying to debate on what to do. Cause you know, coyotes, they have a whole communication network set up between each other. So the coyote internet. Yeah. It's, it's just, I I mean, at the time it felt absolutely supernatural. It felt, you know, freaky as shit just cause your body's overloaded. And yeah. Could the coyotes kill you? Uh, yeah, awesome. if, they, if if I was exhausted and they really wanted to, there was you know a few of them. Sure, well, definitely. John, have you had any uh, hairy experiences when it comes to these animals? Not, not so much. Hmm, not so much. We ran into some bears in Olympic National Park when we were walking out after. Um, I, I guess I don't want to spoil the book, but when we were um, up there uh, looking at the area where where uh, Jacob had been found and. Um, and some bears crossed the trail right in front of us and, um, and bears don't see very well. So um, they were trying to get away from us, but they ended up coming up the trail or sort of the path of least resistance. And, um, and so I don't know, I, I think uh, most of my interfaces with wildlife had just been, um, um, you know, the, the animals trying to, to not have to deal with me. <laughs> I, I love this, by the way, it was just posted right now by myself Nothing personal, hiker. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I didn't feel like they were going to attack. Um, I mean, coyotes, um, mo- pretty much all animals are pretty peaceful towards people. Um, usually, they're more weirded out by you are than them. So I'm not mm. trying to. See, I, c- I could beat up out. one coyote. They don't, yeah. they don't want to deal with that. Yeah, exactly. I'd be a very mm. risky target, even if they went for it. I didn't mean to cast coyotes in that negative light. That was really funny, though. Well, the black bears in your area, you were describing how they're kind of living like kings up in Olympic National Park. Like, they have everything they could possibly need, and they don't need to, to eat human beings. Right. They've got salmon. They've got blueberries. They're, they're doing well. <laughs> yeah. Is it true, by the way, like Joe Rogan says, that if you eat a bear, bear meat, it either tastes like salmon or it tastes like blueberries? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, you know, I've eaten bear. What an bear. idiot that guy is. I've eaten bear and it's about, it's just about my least favorite protein that I've had. So uh, yeah. How would you describe the taste? 
Uh, well, everybody says gamey, right? But it's 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 sort of musky, strong, sort of um, hormony. <laughs> I've heard there are uh, avocado bears in California, in like some areas where they <laughs> eat, uh, they raid avocado fields. They're they have green meat, apparently. I, I might have also heard this on Joe Rogan, but <laughs> that, yeah, that I sounds don't know. delicious. <laughs> <laughs> what what do you think is the most underrated uh, piece of meat? To me. <laughs> oh underrated ah uh, wow elk elk is delicious wild wild elk not game not farmed elk but wild elk mm, yeah i've tried uh the farmed elk at least i assume it's farmed because it's from uh uh a farm you know so they're probably and there are some restrictions on buying wild meat like i can't uh, seem to find any at uh, the farmer's market do you know like why, why is that why are they holding out Oh wow! Uh, I I think I think it's probably uh, game warden regulations and game and fish regulations, and not not to encourage the the trafficking of um, and poaching of of big game. I can mm. tell you, Lev. Also, um, it's totally it's totally that. And um, uh, in the mid 1800s, there was a big problem. Um, you know, when people started moving out west, um, they would set up. Uh, you know, meat, like they, they would, you know, and you could just sell any kind of meat on the side of the road or whatever. And there's lots of people just who would go out and kill whatever in huge numbers. Um, and that's a big part of what contributed to, you know, the bison getting wiped out and all that stuff is um, there was just a huge, huge market for, for game meat. Well, now we still have a, we still have bison. Like we didn't uh, luckily wipe all of them out. And uh, I tried bison as well. Bison is really, uh, it, it's another meat, I think. It's, uh, you know, it's really good quality. And also recently, like I was telling people before, I recently got into uh, drinking raw milk and uh, raw cream and kefir and things like that. And it really tastes incredible. I've never tasted anything like it in my life. John, uh, have you also had a similar? Uh... I, I concur with the bison. It's, my, it's maybe my favorite pro Bison and, and, and salmon, I think, maybe are my favorite proteins. But yeah, the, if more people, you know, it's funny. They, I think they need to work on their distribution and their marketing. You know, if, if more people tried bison, I think it would be a bigger, a bigger thing in, in, in America. Definitely. And there was a uh, dude in your book who was a, uh, a mountain man. And he was causing all kinds of trouble. So hearkening back to what we were talking about earlier with the fires where a lot of uh, rich people end up buying up a lot of property. This guy wasn't having any of it. He basically declared all of it to be his and he, you know, messed up their houses. Like what, what exactly was going on there? Yeah. And, and, and you know, I don't, I don't know if it's going to lead into this, but it, it, he, uh, he roamed not far from where that monolith was found recently. <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah, uh, that guy. The, yeah, the, they call him the Mountain Man, and um, he's he's an interesting character. So, so you probably have have fantasized or thought about what you're going to do after the apocalypse, right? When the apocalypse happens, what's your what's your game plan? And um, he was doing it before the apocalypse, sort of pre-apocalyptic sort of uh, living, where he would um, he 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 got he ran afoul with the law several times uh, in California and in Utah, and um, Troy Knapp, he, that's his name, right? Troy Knapp. Troy, Troy James Knapp, yeah. He decided he could he could live pretty well in southern Utah in the backcountry. Um, first of all, he's a really tough, really knowledgeable outdoorsman and basically an outdoor athlete. But he, he would need to resupply. So he would do some hunting, but everything else he would get from these, these remote cabins that are sort of peppered throughout um, – southern utah and he would he would break in or he would just sometimes they were these cabins are not even locked and he would um and i say cabins and some of them were really nice mountain homes and he would just help himself to whatever was in the cupboard uh the liquor cabinet um sometimes the satellite tv uh the bed uh ammunition firearms um that would be his resupply and then he would move on to the next place over the mountain and um he did this for a while and it really concerned the locals uh so much so that the fbi got involved was and, he like a suspect in any disappearances or anything like that or well okay that's a that's a great question so um he may be now he may be a suspect now there's a 
there's a uh, there's a strange and I don't want you know I don't want to you know I don't want to uh, accuse anybody of anything but there's a there's a really strange unsolved cold case homicide in that county on that national forest where he was where he was um, helping himself to some of these cabins and I think probably authorities are looking at that homicide and just seeing if, if they can make any kind of a connection with the, with this, the mountain man but um other than that uh he's in he's in federal uh prison right now but um we got to get him on he, along with ted kaczynski that would be a good show yeah <laughs> yes. yeah that would be i would tune in for that <laughs> well I'm, I'm looking at some photos of him now he looks very healthy like just looking at him like i'm not sure uh, how else he like I don't, I don't know if he does drugs or whatever but just looking at the guy you can tell like people could benefit from a lot of what this guy does a lot of people who right now may still be living in a lot of these areas, but are just glued to the television set and uh, taking oxycodone or whatever. Like, I just wonder how many people, how many resilient people did the system just kind of screw over, you know, based on creature comforts, where it was much more easier for people to just like lay down and not fight against the elements like this guy did. No, it's, it's true. This guy, this guy would literally, um, you know, in deep, deep snow with snowshoes, he would, he would put a 70 pound pack on and, and walk over two ridges. I had an FBI agent tell me <laughs> that he might, he might hike, he might hike 20 miles in the snow in a given day carrying a full load. I mean, um, oh my they, God. They, they, they had, they, that's why they had a hell of a time trying to, trying to catch him. Wow, I'm, I'm looking at him now. What a specimen, by the way. Look at his profile here. Like, I don't mean to make a scientific <laughs> oh subject wow. out of him, but, uh, you know, this is, uh, there's something very crow magnony about him. You know what I mean? Powerful physiognomy, for sure. Yeah. And by the way, speaking of physiognomy, we also have a, uh, we have another donation. John, we are getting so many donations today. So, okay, $3 from Lurkhorm. All these, all these Norwegians, what is going on? I usually don't donate to these streams, but wow, that white boy with the glasses and the Norwegian accent is super cute. <laughs> Tell him to DM me at Snuff, uh, Snuff King Groyper on Twitter. Who are all these people? What, what's going on? I, I, I don't know. I, I you, wanna... you, told me, you told me to share the links. Good. Share the link. Good. I'm happy you shared the links. This is great. Guys, don't forget to subscribe to Break the Rules. I am more than happy to make this whole thing about Culture Barbar in the coming weeks. We're going to have him back. He's going to do whatever you want. Just send in requests, and uh, he's going to do them. So anyway, uh, I wanted to get to the robot grandmother and what was going oh, on right. with, that, with that kid. That was like one of the uh, most this, interesting... This... Ties in a little with my story, how the kids saw a family friend at at this house that like no longer existed, and the the family friend denied it. So like the doppelganger thing comes up. So John, what exactly was going on like with that doppelganger uh, situation with that kid? Could help me out here. The doppelganger situation. Yes, there was so a kid. He he um went missing and when they finally found him, they had stories of him being in a, a cave and there were like, there were old weapons and weird trinkets all around. And he said his grandmother was there, but it, it wasn't really her. There were sparks coming out of her head or something crazy like that. <laughs> the robot Do grandmother. This, this was a, uh, this was a part in your book. This is one of, one of my favorites. Wait, 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 robot. Okay. You're, yes. My, my yes, book. Yes, this is in your book. Well, this, it, it was, <laughs> This is a uh, a a Pilates thing originally, I think. And I, I when I read it from your book, I actually thought you went into a little more detail on it. Should should I read the quote? I'll do that right now. Go for yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Let me see if I can. Uh, I gotta find it real quick. So I, I've got it pulled up right here. Right. Uh, Excellent. Feel you free. DM'd it. I can read it if you want. Okay. Go for it. Go for okay, it. Okay. So uh, in September 2011, a three-year-old boy was missing for five hours on the shoulder of Mount Shasta. The boy claims he was oh. kidnapped by a robot. Yeah. Do you? I can keep going. Or if no. This okay. Your okay. No. No. Please. Please keep going. I, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was uh, so. This kid came, claims he was kidnapped by a robot that was a double of his grandmother. The robot grandma took him to a cave filled with spiders, guns, and purses. While in the cave, he was examined by robot humanoids and told he was put inside his mother's stomach by them, who are from outer space. After a few hours, they placed him by a river to be found. 
He was found by Siskiyou County Sheriff's Deputy uh, Sam Kubowitz and his canine, Tom, a three-year-old Dutch <laughs> Shepherd. The grandmother, whom the boy believes had a robot double, said she was somehow removed from her tent and sleeping bag and woke up face down in the dirt. She felt sick that day and suffered a puncture wound on the back of her head as if she'd been bitten by a spider. Right. So I, I, I remember that now. And that's one of those ancillary cases. There are so many. There, there are hundreds of weird, weird, weird anecdotes like that. And um, for, for all I know, that's, that's a legit case. Um, and, and, um, you know, maybe you could talk, you know, being, you know, he, uh, heading out to Mount Shasta, um, you know, there, there's stories of these networks of tunnels that go for yeah. miles and miles under there and these, um, sort of dwarf people. And, um, it's, it, that, that it's really interesting rock. I yeah. I mean, it's, it's a dormant, it's a, well, I don't even know if it's a dormant volcano. It's, um, I mean, it's, it, it erupts, it erupted, I think several hundred years ago, most recently, but, um, yeah, it's got, I'm sure there are tons and tons of lava tubes. I mean, there, there are, you know, very elaborate cave systems in that whole area. Um, I've spent some time, I haven't spent a lot of time on Shasta, but I've spent a decent amount of time, um, in the Trinity range, like the, Cl like the Klamath, uh, national forest area. Um, which also has the same cave networks and similar um, volcanic not it's it's sort of on the edge of the Shasta volcanic system but there's still um, it's the geology there is still uh, affected by it and you you have these huge cave systems there have been some really freaky stories of people getting lost in the caves um, and yeah it's I mean it's like you said it's a it's a hot spot for paranormal stuff um, when, when you're up there too, what, what's interesting about that mountain, um, and I think to some degree Mount Rainier too, but um, you know, most of it's above tree line. And so some of these missing cases have been people that are with a group and you can see them and then you turn around and that person's gone. And, and that's just, that's just really hard to explain when it's just sort of snow fields and um, you know, large uh, scope as far as what you can see. When I when I really go off the deep end, sometimes I theorize that that underground these underground in these places are deep underground military bases where they're they're literally they're like messing with the people on top in like weird MK Ultra experiments. Well, I can sometimes go I can go off. even deeper. What if these aren't just military bases, but they're ancient military bases? Like they look like today's <laughs> military bases wow. because they would have gone to the same conclusions when they created like the Atlantean tech back in the day, but they're <laughs> still there. Those bunkers are still there to this day and they are accessible. And they would also go into Agartha, which is the inner earth, which is where uh, perhaps uh, some of the Nazis ended up uh, fleeing after World War II. And then there was Operation High Jump, you know, Admiral Byrd trying to get in there and the UFOs fighting him. It's a whole thing. It's a whole thing people like talking about it and it is again very romantic but it does make me think with all the things that have occurred with uh the battle of los angeles uh in the late 40s the foo fighters you know around the uh, uh flying around the pentagon and all these uh ex-soviet people talking about all this uh technology like the blueprints that they got uh, from uh, from the nazis back in the day like i don't know with that recent ufo sighting as well that the navy you know they said that yes this is a ufo like they confirmed it so it does make one wonder how deep that particular rabbit hole goes and if the conclusions would actually change the way we look at uh, our entire history if not our our existence there's there's um a, there's a story that it's not it's not totally substantiated someone left a youtube comment saying they found an m-shaped cave uh it just in like a rock face and they tried to go in it, but they got this real sense of like vibration and discomfort that made them just leave. And they were kind of, um, they were documenting this whole thing. They were arguing with people in the, in the chat. And then ultimately they, they said they were going to go back and kind of document it. and they took some videos out there. Eventually it just, it just stopped and disappeared. And a lot of people theorized that, uh, he, he went missing or something, but, um, 
the one thing I find interesting is that a lot of times people will get these feelings of discomfort or vibration or terror or heat or something like that. But the government actually uses active denial systems, especially around like if you're close to to like what could be a um, a a concealed base or something like that, that it will actually heat up your skin. It's like being in a microwave if you're too close. I think like these sensations happen a lot in like Bigfoot reports. A lot of the time you'll, you'll find people having like irrational terror suddenly and things like that. And then I feel like now the, I guess the, um, the national parks are like federal land. So if you wanted to put the base down there so and like steal people in order to like do human sacrifices or whatever for the Illuminati, that's probably the best way to do it. Right. And by the way, over here, uh, John, I'm curious what you think as someone uh, who's uh, been around nature a lot. This is from Antarctica. You could find this on Google Maps if you go into Antarctica. Would you say this is a natural hole? Like, uh, I've seen a lot of these holes just looking up at the maps uh, being displayed like this. The shape of it, is this something that can be done by uh, nature? Or do you think that there's something going on here that may be uh, man-made? Wow. That's, that's, I'm studying that now. That's really interesting. Um, I don't know, you know, uh, Edgar Allan Poe thought that there were uh, underground civilizations in Antarctica, you know, um, Admiral, Admiral Byrd, like you say, uh, speaking of Norway, uh, Roald Amundsen, who uh, was the first, uh, first person to the South Pole, um, he's, he's a missing person. He, he vanished uh, without a trace after he um got back from from the from the the south pole expedition so and here um, and here is another one just just so you see that there's there's not just one going on here like it's probably going to take me a while to find all of them but uh here is one more one more example of a hole see this is a different one over here so um, yeah like wow. you, you can look these images up there for the public to see and everybody's just fine with it like oh don't don't pay attention to these holes i guess nobody's interested that's the other thing by nobody i mean like us we're we're interested and there's like maybe this much of us and this much of people who just want to watch the kardashians and that's why we're in the situation we're in today absolutely but when it comes to uh, another thing, by the way, with those little people that were mentioned before, Cowboy wrote to me, he said that, um, yes, they are also in the island counties. Best thing is to build fairy houses for them. This is a sign of peace. Give wide birth. They cause earthquakes and whatnot. Thousands of types of spirits there. So, yeah, again, going back to this whole theme of other things uh, coming into effect. And you've also described a feeling of heat that when when there was a uh, you know crossing through the uh, forest, there was a certain area where there was this really hot sensation going on. Yeah, yeah. Randy, Randy, and, and Tanya uh, were out searching one day, and they they talked about that. And Randy came back to the the, the Bigfoot bar in the base there, really, um, I guess, excited about having having. Um, they, they were hiking out and. Um, a tree sort of parted their path and they went, they each took a different side of the tree and they, they felt this, 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 uh, this temperature sensation and this sort of barometric drop, like, um, like a concussion or a, a percussive sense. And um, they decided it was extremely unusual and um, yeah. Who's to say? Uh, yeah. The there other... are a couple spots in the woods near where I live um, that are kind of like that. When you walk into them, they get, really co weirdly cold all of a sudden um and they're very quiet too well the other one uh the other th oh and here we have owen aka myself joining us i wonder what he has in store for us today so uh owen owen, oh. owen great great to see you again owen oh not with the british accent thing immediately as soon as i join <laughs> it's always the british accent Every time. Every, every time, indeed. Uh, yeah. One day, I hope you're going to go on the stream completely blue. Because you are. You are I the will. blue man. Can you post that picture, by the way, again, for all the good Oh, yeah, people, sure. No for worries. For John to no see worries. what exactly we're talking about yes. here. But speaking okay. speaking of blue deities, uh, one of the people in your book was talking about how um, he was... Uh, he came oh, back. I didn't blow it. Whatever. No, it doesn't matter. This is just the body. Okay. But anyway, he, yeah. here it is. This is the blue man, J John. What What do you think of this fine specimen? 
<laughs> that would that would scare me in the woods. Well, brilliant. I'm gonna come and scare you. Like I'm gonna find your house and I'm just gonna like knock on the window of me in that like costume. Uh, that would be quite quite a sight. So anyway, there was a dude in your book who was talking about how he came back and now he's known as Kalki. And Kalki is supposed to be at the end of the Kali Yuga, the figure who would come back and reset things back to the uh, Satya Yuga or the Age of Truth or the Golden Age or whatever you want to call it. So I don't know if you have any more inside info on what exactly happened with this guy, because that's a pretty tall order to call yourself Kalki. It's like calling yourself the Messiah, you know, or even more. So you're gonna to have to you're gonna to have to refresh my memory again on, on the part of the book where that is. <laughs> oh sure, no problem. I'm going to I'm going to find it right now. But while I am searching for it, does anybody else here have a question for John? While I'm searching, we were for talking it? about we're talking about uh, like these religious experiences and stuff like that, going up into the mountain to find God, something like that. How much of this? How much of disappearances as a whole too? Do you think are manic episodes? Yeah, that's you know I I feel like. Um, I feel like mental mental health is behind. Wow, I hate to put a math figure to this, but um, boy, uh, the real tricky cases. I feel like many of them um, come down to there's a mental health issue at play, and um, that that was definitely a, a theme um, in the cases that I looked at, and um, which makes it really tricky for for searchers too, because most. Like in Jacob's case, you know, most people will follow a water course down the mountain and eventually come to, um, you know, a river or a road. And, um, you know, he defied the, the statistics. He went up. There's, a, there's a, a scientist, a search and rescue expert named Robert Coaster who, you know, he's, he aggregates all these behaviors. And uh, he, wrote, he wrote a book called Lost Person Behavior. And search and rescue professionals will, will have this manual with them and they'll, uh, they'll look up the, the probable um, uh, behaviors of, of someone who's missing. And, and you know, the uh, people with mental health issues um, uh, oftentimes yeah. will do the opposite. Yeah. And I found so it right over here, by the way, this is the Kalki guy. It says, the same month, a Pacific Crest trail hiker from Los Angeles claims he was lured off trail by the beautiful voice of a siren. Yeah, here we go again. The siren was a beautiful woman with otherworldly blue eyes. He was held captive in a cave and given secret information by the woman. He returned to the world and changed his name to Lord Kalki, who he, compl who he claims is a Hindu god. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Go, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, John. I just wanted to say with regards to spirits and these kind of entities that people come across often, I find um, people are very quick to focus on the wackiness um, and the kind of the, the inconsistent things the person comes out with. But we have to keep in mind that a lot of these spirits or whatever, um, especially ones that tend to lure people away and, um, you know, kind of fey uh, and spirits like that, they often give information in a way that it's like an overload and overload and they kind of, it, it tends to drive the person crazy so that when they return, um, they don't know how to even, um, you know, express the, what they were taught. And that's actually kind of intentional. So, you know, if, if someone comes back and says, you know, in a very, um, you know, a very well-rounded way, what he heard and what he thinks it means, you'd be more likely to listen to him. But if he comes back saying, you know, acting all confused and saying that he's Kalki, you're going to brush him off as a bit of a crazy person. I find that's in most cases of just a regular person going off into the woods and having this, you know, um, supernatural, for lack of a better term, uh, you know, experience they tend to come back and sound quite crazy. But if you'd, um, you know, especially someone who knows, has more insight on this sort of world, if you sit them down and try and help them get through it, they can give what really happened to them. And usually the root of it is they were lured in by something, uh, they were given knowledge, and it was incredibly disorientating, uh, probably for some specific kind of vampiric purpose, because um, a lot of people who you find 
suffer from like vampirism or like some sort of curse or whatever, they often have these delusions of being really important and being some sort of like untouchable, you know, deity. So that you can see how that would stop them from thinking that they could possibly be victims, you know. Um, so that's just that that stood out to me. But it's really interesting. Um, well, that for, guy about I'm going to have to find that extract if you could send it to me, Lev, absolutely. about the guy calling himself Kalki. Well, Very first, interesting. First, you could also substitute the wilderness for 4chan, and it would be an apt example of what a lot of people go through today. But also, when it comes to vampirism. I'm curious, what exactly do you mean by that? Like, what would the people experiencing this vampirism do? Would they go after human blood or just any kind of blood? Like, what's going on there? I'd mean more of an energetic vampirism. So you find a lot of people, a lot of cases I deal with, uh, especially, you know, curses or uh, hexes or something like that. They People will remark there was a period, maybe a week or so, of them just absolutely having no energy. And it's something you can recognize, uh, especially if you meet the person uh, face to face and you try and like sense their kind of aura, so to speak. Um, you could see, you know, the energy body or the chakras, as it's called, you know, it, those are primarily what I mean by like vampirism. It's the draining of that uh, you see in a lot of occult um, you know, societies like we discussed last time I was on, someone was discussing how Aleister Crowley during his initiation was sodomized and that was a draining of his kundalini, you know, his root chakra. So that's a type of vampirism. Uh, in terms of vampiric entities, you know, it's, it's more of a, you know, general term. I don't think, you know, vampires as they are in folklore and stuff are sort of, um, like aristocratic noblemen who practice left-hand paths kind of draining. Uh, and you can see that in even today, a lot of business people higher up and especially in Hollywood, uh, they kind of drain people of energy. Um, you can see a kind of a, a good version of that in David Goggins. I don't know if any of you are familiar with David Goggins, but he remarked how he'd take people's souls when he was training um in the military he'd, he'd you know be pushed to the limit by his training uh, instructors and he'd do it with a smile on his face and he said when they'd see that they'd think back to how hard it was for them going through that training and it would just completely uh he'd completely steal their energy from them so that's what i mean by vampirism um and these entities could be classed as vampiric uh, especially huldras and these kind of uh, women in the woods or whatever that draw people in they usually uh, confuse people make them think that they're like some untouchable you know deity and an ignorant person would come out thinking that and then of course it's very hard to sit them down and go listen <laughs> you were essentially drained you were you know you're a victim of this thing you need to you know uh, understand it would you say so, that uh, pornography yeah. is a similar like uh, as far as the effects you know people talk about uh being drained, you know, sexually, not when they're having sex, but when they're, you know, just uh, fapping it to porn. 100%, 100%. Pornography is one of the, it's an industry of egregores that are designed to drain people and, you know, but no when people, one feels people good seek, after it. But when people seek to do that in the first place, like if a couple decides like, oh, like, uh, you know, why don't we make some money, you know, and uh, you're going to pose naked, I'm going to photograph you. I don't think that most of those people have it in mind like, oh, you know, we're going to uh, steal yeah. people's essences. So these forces yeah. need consent and it doesn't really matter how they get it. But yeah, it's the, the people who like that's a good point about the um... I mean, what do you mean by how they get consent? Because if it's like they're not getting consent, that just sounds like rape, man. Like, from the, well, well, the thing is, I'm saying they are get, uh, people are giving their consent to to having that, you know, I know it's just you phrased it like it was rape last week. But when, um, but when you well, say giving, pro... <laughs> but when you say you get consent... bogged down in this porn thing all day, we could do that. No, I would, yeah. I would definitely want to have men. By the way, guys, we are in luck because on December three, Tuesday, December three, we are going to have an Alistair Crowley stream. So Outlaw, I hope you can join us for that as well as anybody else who's interested. Oh, love to. And also, we're we are going to have an e-girl stream coming up on Thursday, December. Wait, 
uh, Tuesday, December 15th. And that one, I've already gotten a couple of e-girls who do have an OnlyFans account. I just want to are... insult all of them like, no, when they go off. No, this is I not. Want to insult all of this them. is. Uh, you you should know this better than anybody, Owen. This I know. Is a, uh, I know. A live I know stream of peace. Tolerant. I I have a comment that can get us back on track. So go if for you ever, it. If you feel like it. <laughs> so okay, there's a lot of of stories of urban disappearances of people who had manic episodes. They got they got they disappeared. They got lost. Whatever couldn't find them for a long time just in an urban environment in a city then there's this one story that i think of there's a kid this happened to uh he worked at a grocery store and one day he was just overwhelmed by the world he disappeared eventually they figured out that he crawled into an area behind the freezers at the grocery store he worked at and he was stuck there he died there nobody could hear his screams over the fans so to oh. think how easy that something like this could happen in the wilderness is what i'm comparing it to Hmm. I mean, if you go back, I mean, it's, it's we're talking about all these cave systems and stuff. It's it's perfectly feasible that there's some sort of little small sinkhole, you know, on the side of a mountain that's just got a little bit of soil, you know, loose soil over it. And you just step in the wrong spot and, you know, you're gone. And it might be, you know, of a consistency where it'll close up around you. I mean, this this kind of stuff does happen. And when it comes to spots that people are trying to find right now instead of the ones that are secluded. Let's talk about that big, weird-looking uh, monolith. What exactly is going on there? Is it an art project? Is it something bigger? See, I didn't even watch... I didn't even watch the video with the full sound on, and I sort of scrubbed through certain areas of it, and what I saw looked really bizarre. There was like a goat, like a goat action figure, and an arch... Uh, action figure next to each other. Why is there a goat? What does a goat have to do with any of this? What, what's going what on? What is the best it, source for this? Is there Are there decent sources or is it like New Age Uprising dot org or some weird thing like that? Well, th this was just a news report. Like this was just a local news report that uh, was gotcha. documenting this thing. And I don't know why they used like a goat for like they had a map with a goat on it. I'm, I'm going to find that uh, that screen capture for those who don't know. But anyway, Thank John, you. what do you make of uh, this? Well, they were, um, the goat, I think the goat's a bigghorn sheep and the uh, biologist, uh, game and fish biologist found, found this monolith, apparently, from what mm -hmm. I understand from the Salt Lake Tribune. Wow. And um, what's, what's really interesting to me is, 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 I don't know if you spent much time in Southern Utah, but it's, it's you know, it's remote. This apparently is in San Juan County in the southeast um, corner, which borders um, Arizona and Colorado, uh, and a, I think a little bit of New Mexico. But um, but what's interesting to me is they're the reason they're not telling anyone the exact location of where this monolith is is because they feel like people are going to get lost and in trouble trying to find it. It's that remote. Um, I, I don't know that they're worried about somebody damaging it, but um, vandalizing it, but they're, they're, they, it's so remote that um, they found it with a helicopter. So um, yeah, and just look how, look how well planted it is. I, I reckon it's an art project. Just I reckon that it. too. It just, just because feels it like reminds I'm... me too much it feels like it's inspired too much by what is it 2001 yeah yeah. Like, space space Odyssey. Odyssey. yeah yeah it it seems just too like <laughs> and the, the guys who found it yeah they were looking for i think they were flying or something i think they landed the plane and my whole i thing, could be wrong but yeah well my whole thing would be just like what happened in roswell once something like this gets ground especially today with people being able to contact other people really quickly you know it, I don't think it would go out there. I think it this would is, be instantly hidden away and uh, nobody would know about it. Here's what I'm surprised about. We got Salt Lake City, and, I, and it reminds me not only of um, of Space Odyssey, that that whole deal. It it reminds me of the story of the origin of Mormonism, how Joseph Smith went and he had to dig up these plates that were buried. Oh, I'm surprised yeah. this doesn't have the Book of Mormon tr like engraved into the side of it or something like that. That's, that's very interesting, thing. actually. That's a good point. I didn't even think about that. But one thing that they did remark in the video, one of the guys said how weird it is because he was like, you reckon you, he's like, you notice how the monolith is lined up with um, this kind of arch in the wall. So maybe, you know, like there was some kind of arch or like crack in the wall behind it. 
and it was lined up with this monolith. So maybe um, like, you know, there was some significance behind that, but yeah, it definitely does not look like anything more than a kind of an art project that was put there. And um, that's just how I feel, sense looking at it. But I wonder if, I it's wonder- There's a lack of detail to it. Like if it was anything, potentially that had meaning or hidden meaning there would be more to it there'd be inscriptions there'd be more around it you'd hear more it's just a big fucking block a little too brutalist for you yeah a little bit too brutalist for any inspiration or anything just a big block not a fan. what's it what's it made out of does anyone know what it's made out of it's made out of art project that's what it is (laughs) paper is closed (laughs) and it looks way too fresh to have been yeah the old yeah it looks really new that's yeah. that was the other thing it's been there for at least four years apparently according to um, people looking on google earth and stuff like at old pictures mm, interesting there's were... probably fucking banksy <laughs> <laughs> oh don't give banksy any more credit than he deserves thanks for the hack Owen, you are the new Banksy. I can, I can feel it. I can feel your energy. No, I'm the that. new whatever his name is, German guy. Whatever that German guy was. I'm more him than I'm Banksy. Banksy's annoying. Okay, whatever, whatever that German guy is. And there is yeah. a, uh, uh, the monolith on Mars. If you guys remember that, where uh, the University the of Mars Arizona... Moon, Phobos, I believe. Oh yeah, yeah, the Mars Moon. Here it is for all of you guys who don't remember what I'm talking about. Here's what it looks like. And by the way, we are at uh, 2,189 subscribers. Please subscribe for the sake of this monolith right here so it'll give you good energy. But I don't <laughs> Buzz know. Aldrin confirmed that on C-SPAN and the videos on YouTube. It's one of my favorite like weird videos. So when he confirmed it, would you mean that it's possible to take his words out of context? Maybe he didn't confirm it or it, was he like... He seems to be uh purposely vague which seems honestly i think it's because i don't know i think it's like the the secret society member like he's the freemason in him or something like that he wants to leave it vague but he does say that it is a monolith which um i'm not sure exactly what that word implies i don't want to jump to conclusions if that's made by man or or what or if it's just one solid thing but he says they don't know how it got there and it could have been placed there by god which that's an ambiguous statement but i think it's a very curious one as well because it's definitely supernatural if you take it as god or like what does he think god is is that aliens well, like God, oh. if this is God, God's dicking around on like the roller coaster two like editor or something like this feels a bit like <laughs> random i don't know is this someone else larping as space odyssey stuff who fucking really likes space odyssey now we're getting this stuff on the moon they're just sending the show up there someone really fucking likes that film in the universe they didn't they didn't get cell phones right like they had these space phones but nobody was walking around with a cell phone at all like i don't think was there any futuristic movie where there were cell phones oh Uh, shit i think there was um feature i think second one Star Trek had that stuff. They had they had like yeah, Star transponders, Trek, yeah. and they they basically had Skype. Mm, okay, I guess Star Star Trek uh, wins this round. But uh, when it comes to Stanley Kubrick, some people are saying that he was able to predict certain things, or he like faked the moon landing or whatever. Like, where where do you guys stand on that? As far as the moon landing, yeah, yeah it was filmed by, it was filmed by Stanley Kubrick for sure. But um, <laughs> in terms of, I find it really like boring when people talk about. Like, we landed on the moon. It's like, yeah, okay, there are yogis in India that landed on fucking Venus, you know? <laughs> you know, it's like, this isn't interesting to me. But, of course, that's like, you know, the, that's just... But there the is a there is yeah there is a material wouldn't. spectral divide where people are much more apt to believe that we do have enough technology to be able to go to the moon and things like that. Which I also you know I I don't know any better than anybody else does, but uh, why not? I assume that that's possible. The only I thing, think yeah, the the best take is that the the images and the video we've seen were faked, but we did mm-hmm. go to the moon. Yeah, we did. They yeah, just didn't yeah. show us. They showed us something else. I agree with that because tape I've ever heard. There's no way that that film can like survive the amount of radiation it takes to go from the moon to Earth and back. Like it's just ridiculous to think. Yeah, it's ridiculous to think that it would somehow, you know, remain perfectly intact. Like it's, I just can't even. But it, the tape was definitely filmed. Maybe not by Stanley Kubrick, but. 
you know, Stanley Kubrick knew about it for sure. I now, found those... a. Sorry, go ahead. No, I wasn't. I wasn't really saying anything. You can go. Uh, okay, I found an interesting. Um, I, I was. Just, I've just been looking through articles about this monolith, and I found um, somebody made an observation that sort of points away from it possibly being a reference to 2001. Um, okay. It's uh, there's a paragraph here. This is just a live science article. I'm sure if you Google a live science monolith, you find it. But it says uh, the monolith in 2001, a space odyssey, is a mysterious rectangle. It seems to trigger rapid evolutionary society leaps in human history. Um, it must be said, however, that the monoliths in the, in the Arthur C. Clarke novels that inspired the movie always have dimensions in a ratio of one to four to nine, which doesn't appear true for the Utah monolith, um, which whose width and depth are the same length. Um, in the movie, the monolith is dark colored and non-reflective, whereas the Utah monolith is, you know, this bright, bright silvery color. Okay, now so, do I now I have another uh, anti whatever argument to that. All right. Maybe they're just retarded college students. Have you thought about that? They just they think, could be, but yeah. why would you go through so much effort to go in the middle of nowhere, cut the uh, you know a perfect a perfect hole into the ground, insert this thing, and have it be so off? If you're trying, because they to didn't want to be joke. like they didn't want it to be exactly like it. They just like inspired. They wanted to do their own thing, which I imagine is something. If I was going to recreate it being a twant, then I'd be like. Oh yeah! Oh, make it like this thing because this thing says something else. Like I don't know. Yeah, that's no, fair. Nobody that's says, fair. by the way, twat quite like a British person. So there we go. <laughs> yeah, it's a very British yes. phrase. By the it way, is. well, John, bollocks. Bollocks, exactly. John, what what do you think? Do you think it's an art project or do you think it's uh, s something else? You know, I, I I don't know. But what one thing I was thinking of today is it, it's expensive. I mean, whatever it's made out of, whether that's you know stainless steel or or no matter what it is, it's, it's expensive. So. Somebody point. really, um, really was into it. So, so who was it that said that um, it goes back as far as four years? Does that mean that you can go on Google Maps, go through the archive and go like five years ago and then it's not there? Or I could. Yeah, I, I assume so. I don't have that uh, up anymore, but I was just looking through Twitter and random um, articles and stuff. And I think, I don't know if it was people on 4chan. Uh, I know that I have right now open uh, on the Dolce Base files. They, they tweeted about it um, that uh, that we've got the coordinates for it. Um, I'll try to find the, the four year one again. Um, there was just two, it was a picture of two, like, you know, two separate screenshots um, from, you know, satellite, some satellite uh, imagery website. And you can see it there in a four-year-old one. I am looking, by the way, right now at uh, an article from science.thewire.in, in, I assume, is India. And there's some images here relating to the Van Allen belts. And they say over here, so... Um, Thus, after leaving the TLI, they traveled in the direction where the geomagnetic plane slopes away from the ecliptic. By the time Apollo 11 reached a distance of about three Earth radii, the geomagnetic axis was tilted almost exactly in the direction of the spacecraft. Thus, the separation between Apollo 11 and the geomagnetic plane was at its maximum. So, um, I guess what they're saying here is that they ended up avoiding it. And they were able to do it as as much as possible. So, and what else did they have? Oh, okay, over here it says uh, the Earth parking orbit is under the inner radiation belt. It transverse the inner zone of the outer belt in about 30 minutes, and through the most energetic region in about 10 minutes. On its way back, its trajectory was optimized such that Apollo 11 would steer clear of the belts as much as possible. So, I don't know. I don't have any other info in front of me here that would say, like, would this amount of time in the Van Allen belt be enough to uh, fry cook people or not? Like, the only thing that I know here are the things that I'm able to find online. So, I don't know. Is Does this give any credence at all to the possibility that these Van Allen belts are not as risky, assume that the uh, flight was done in the right way? Outlaw, what do you think? Uh, could you repeat that again? <laughs> God. God damn it. Here's an image. I'm not going to repeat it. Here, here's an image. The whole thing is there. Okay. You know, they're, they're claiming that there was a way to avoid the worst of the worst, and it was good enough. Oh, okay. You don't buy it. Um, 
I'm not sure about it, to be honest. I never had any particular interest in um, sort of space travel, so to speak. Well, yeah, I don't have any so- interest in actually being right either. I just want to say crazy shit. <laughs> Well, we're going to mm-hmm. eventually get to the bottom of this. Uh, I know this is not in John John's wheelhouse, but still, I wanted to quickly bring it up just so just because we were on the topic of Stanley Kubrick and the monolith and all this stuff. So, yeah, I'm not really sure what else could be said about this monolith. It's a very interesting thing. I'm very fascinated, more to be honest with you, on these tunnels that were talked about, as well as, like, uh, scablands, like... This is something that Randall Carlson talked a lot about, who, like, John, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Randall's work. No. Well, going back to Joe Rogan again for a second, Randall Carlson and Graham Hancock, they were both on the show, and Graham Hancock is the guy who talks about the ancient civilizations. And uh, I kind of um, lean on, again, it's kind of more of a romantic point of view on my part, but I do lean on him being right when it comes to there were all these ancient civilizations back in the day that got wiped out around 12,000 years ago by a giant cataclysm from the uh, destruction of the uh, the ice that was covering the upper part of the United States. And you would still see in these regions, like these scablands, as they would call it, like all these, uh, I don't know, like what ended up happening when the glaciers started to violently you know, move and uh, cause all kinds of problems. And it ended up uh, resulting in a lot of these, according to Graham Hancock, a lot of these ancient civilizations, coastal civilizations being wiped out where people had to restart. And a lot of the legends that we get from the indigenous people who were living like in South America and so on and so forth, and even like the old Kings list, like they point to, for me, this idea of survivors who had advanced technology who knew how to operate things having to do with frequency, sound, vibration, all this stuff, coming and spreading this around to the people who were left over so that they could start again. And this could also, I guess, be traced to Mount Ararat, where we do have a lot of the uh, Indo-Europeans, Aryans, uh, like whatever you want to call them, like people from this area who started spreading out into different areas. Some of them started, you know, other civilizations like uh, Mesopotamia, and uh, some of them became just like uh, the Scythians who were just living in the Steepy. And it's a very interesting for me uh, thing for me to think that we do have DNA evidence of this area, like around Turkey, Anatolia where the legend goes Mount Ararat was the mountain that Noah's ship was on. And from this area sprang all of these people. So it's a very fascinating thing for me to think about how that may have been what happened. I don't know. This is just one way of looking at the, these things. So I know, John, have you ever uh, looked into any of this stuff? And uh, what is your basic uh, t- take? Uh... Well, yeah. So um, I was thinking this is switching gears a little bit, but maybe related, Lev, is, um, and, and it's a very contemporary, uh, I guess, resolution, if, 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 if you want to call it that, um, going back to September. So, um, and this is more like 800 years ago in the desert southwest of Mesa Verde National Monument, um, National Park, actually. Um, do you know anything about that? And uh, there's a case in the book where a man from Texas went missing in 2013. And it's, it's one of the, one of the weirdest ones. One of the cases that I think about every day, or I was thinking. Uh, The the glyphs, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so are you, are you familiar with what happened in September regarding that case? And no, what what happened? Well, um, this is, this is after the book came out, but um, um, so, okay. So in 2013, um, uh, a Texas family, Dale Staling and his wife were, were in Southwestern Colorado on vacation and their, their motor home um, broke down and it was, it was getting repaired. And so um, they went to Mesa Verde national park, which is, um, which is not extreme by, by national park standards. It's not Yosemite. It's not glacier. It's not Yellowstone. It, it's more of a sort of a living museum uh, of the, of these, uh, 800 or thousand year old cliff dwellings. And um, so Dale, his wife went into the air conditioned museum bookstore and he could see one of the, one of the dwellings from the parking lot. And it was a really hot day in the summer. And he was just going to walk the wheelchair accessible path down to the dwellings and take a look. And I, 
um, when you go there, you, you almost have to do that. If you just, it's just a very easy walk down there and um, it's, it, it looks really interesting from the parking lot. And his wife said, fine. She went into the museum and uh, he walked down there and that's the last that they, that they saw him. And he had a bad back. He, he didn't have water. He wasn't planning or prepared to go much further. And some, some tourists from Germany said, oh yeah, we, um, we saw him at the petroglyphs, which are about a mile down the path. So uh, you know how that goes, you see one thing and then you want to see the other thing. And, and so long story short, he, he disappeared. He was missing for seven years. He was found an anonymous person because they were hiking off trail in the national park. An anonymous person uh, called in the location of his body in September and what's interesting and he was 4.2 miles away from where he was last seen and what's 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 strange to me about that case and fascinating about that case is that um, in that same month in the same week of September of just this year uh, some 20 indigenous bodies were reinterred in the park the area of the park and they had been taken to Finland by uh, in the 1890s by uh, I don't know whether he's some sort of archaeologist anthropologist and, in the name of, of science back then. And so the same the same week that those bodies were returned to the park, Dale Stelling's body is revealed. And they've been looking really hard for him for seven years. Jesus Christ. Wow. That's like a little, like a little trade off going on there. It's something, yeah. A, some, a tit for wow. tat. Well, this this also reminds me of the uh, that unfortunate case with that kid whose clothing, like sneakers and uh, uh, pants, ended up being found in pristine condition. Like that's the other thing that really boggles me about these uh, these reads in your book. It's like, why would it be so pristine? Like, unless there's like a serial killer who was saving it. I, I don't know. It, that serial killer angle I don't think is so far fetched when I when I look at there's a serial killer in uh, in Ohio who was just going out into the woods to hunt people um, and th there's been there's uh, been the tube sock murderer who would find couples who are sleeping at night in their sleeping bags and then shoot both of them and then like tie a tube sock around the woman's throat and stuff like that it's not unheard of. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that a serial killer is behind uh, one of the main stories in the book, uh, the Amy Bechtel story. Yeah, um, and I I think he he may be the the Great Basin serial killer. I'm looking up, up right now just to uh, see his face. Could you elaborate on all of that? Yeah, so so in in 1997, um, a young woman she was training in uh, she lived in Lander, Wyoming, in the in the Wind River mountain range she was training for the olympic marathon trials and just uh one of the one of the um consistencies in the book or i i, I focus on a lot of outdoor athletes and she she uh this is her right she, um yeah right there yeah that's amy uh an elite athlete and um she was uh, she was on a run and um, her husband is, uh, was a professional rock climber, too. And he was in a different part of the state with a friend. So he had witnesses that, that, that proved that he wasn't in the area when she went missing. Because, of course, they, they, they blame the husband. Him. Right, right, right. And statistically, yeah. that's, that's valid, you know. Yeah. And um, so what's interesting. So they, they searched like, like this, uh, her husband, Steve, got all of his climbing buddies and they, I mean, they combed those mountains. It's kind of like the Bigfoot hunters in, in, in the Olympic, in the Olympic National Park is nobody knows that country better than these locals. And, and so the, the, the search was exhaustive. And so they combed the mountains and they, they, they still haven't found her. But, but another, you know, I don't know if you believe in coincidences, but uh, I'm not sure I do. But um, this serial killer, Dale Wayne Eaton, you know, it's one of those serial killers with a with a with a with a middle you know middle name that's also a first name, right? Dale Wayne Eaton. Um, his family's elk hunting camp was less than half a mile from where Amy's car was found. So um, that's pretty strange um, because he was already um, this guy was was already in the um, the state penitentiary in Rollins, Wyoming. That's him there. 
um, and they they think he may be responsible. Like he he roamed from Nevada to Utah to, to Montana and Idaho and all over the the West. They think he might be the Great Basin serial killer. And he was the same guy who almost uh, killed a, a family in a car, and they managed to uh, boot him out just in time. Yeah, it was a family right out of a right out of a movie. Um, a family. Um, with a their van broke down on on interstate 80 and they had the hood up and he came up and his old man offered to help him and ended up kidnapping them in their own vehicle they had a baby and um it was one of these one of these uh chases where the van takes off into the desert and um they they managed to they managed to get his uh shotgun away from him and um i mean he's lucky they didn't shoot him um but uh yeah he's yeah a bad dude well in light in lighter subjects one uh, very interesting character from your book who i really liked was the hound dog man i don't remember his name right now but he has all these cadaver hound dogs <laughs> and he uh doesn't give them treats except for what was it donuts or uh well we i know he would go to he go to wendy's apparently wendy's will give give uh sell you burgers for your dog mm. for 50, 50 cents and so um lots of Wendy's burgers uh, and uh yeah Duff his name's Alan Duffy he lives in the front range of Colorado and he yeah that he would the, the way he would tra he trains his bloodhounds is he will go um he'll buy pig's blood from the market and then he'll go to the the nail salon and get nail and hair clippings and trimmings and put them in plaster of Paris and make these sort of um these sort of uh cadaver plugs that he uses to train the dogs and um it's really really strange but um you know he's motivated his brother his brother went missing in southern california when he was when he was younger and um that that possessed him and he's you know he's dedicated uh his whole life to trying to help these poor families in in, in these situations and um he'll go out with his crazy bloodhounds and um, try to help it's funny that you say the bloodhounds are the crazy ones, but, uh, well, I guess I, I loved, by the way, that in the, uh, description of that, uh, what, what was it? That's scenario with the robot grandma, that there was a dog that somebody named Tom, what a great <laughs> name for a dog. That's like my, my, my cat is named Steve. So I, I feel, I feel a lot for the owners that end up giving very human like names to their pets. I, I was in Hawaii not not too long ago, and the the local dog was was named Kevin. <laughs> oh god! <laughs> I don't know why I find it so funny. I mean, the whole thing is Kevin. just so it's just so weird when you think about it. We're just so used to it, but we have these you know we have these people who are walking around with these other beings, and it's just okay. This is fine, you know, just like on <laughs> on a string, just walking this other creature monster even you know that like i mean it's a lovely creature of course you know dogs are great but just the idea of it you know there's just something so weird you know i, I don't know i, I want to go on the tangent about the dogs but suffice it to say that you have met a lot of very interesting uh characters on this journey and uh i think again going going back to uh go go uh, what is wrong with me everybody subscribe right now so i can get better i did not get enough sleep this night uh -huh. so anyway okay go, bro Go, going back, going back. What is going on with me? Going. Okay, Lev. If you if you yes. can't say, I've got a question. Go uh, for, for it. John. Yes. I've got. I need John because John knows all this stuff about the woods, and he might be able to rationalize this and give an actual answer. Because I've got this like path, like kind of nearby my house. It's like a 10, 15 minute walk away, and there's like a bit where you can go through the fence, and there's a bunch of fucking shoes and like clothes like hung on this tree. And I have no idea why. And there's a bunch of weird stuff there. There's like old televisions that are like broken. There's other things. I think there was used condoms in the way in. So I have like theories based upon that. But I got there to work out sometimes because I like cut a bit off the tree. And it's a really good pull up bar. But what do you think the like pants and stuff and train like the shoes attached to the tree are? Because I have no idea. And that still weirds me out. I've, I've seen that in, in, in really remote Nevada too. It's a, it, it, That's a great question. I... I, I don't know. I, does anyone else have a theory about um, 
these these leavings that I mean i i once saw a a child's backpack i remember it vividly it was a dora the explorer backpack and i was on this trail and it wasn't on the trail it was across a um i don't know what it was exactly but it was just stagnant water something people wouldn't go through but it was right across that and there's this little kid's backpack sitting there i remember being creeped out by it there's nothing inherently creepy about that it's easy to leave something in the woods mm-hmm. but it, it's definitely unsettling yeah, oh, the con- that's the worrying for sure. Yeah. Apparently, people are saying it's in homeless encampment, but I don't agree because it doesn't seem. I've been there before, and there's like houses where I think it where it used to be where bird people did bird watching. If I had to guess, mm. so I, I think homeless people have probably slept there once or twice, but See, some I, weird stuff. I don't know if this is the kind of word that would get us taken off YouTube, but uh, I'm gonna substitute it for something that rhymes with it. A man named Isaac uh, Dappy. A man named Isaac Dappy uh, got very into what was going on with, um, what was his name? And again, this is like the most conspiratorial I'm ever going to get. I don't know what's going on except to say that this guy, he was looking at, uh, who, uh, uh, who was the actor in Big? Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks. <laughs> and he was, <laughs> what is wrong with me? He was looking at Tom Hanks taking pictures on his Instagram all the time of all these like abandoned little kids' shoes. And then this guy ended up finding himself dead, you know, like uh, jumped off a bridge or whatever. And I believe that Tom Hanks took an Instagram photo around like a similar area talking about roadkill. Again, Cappy was, I, was leaking uh, images that were supposedly from inside Epstein's Island with like little girls and like a some sort of like bath. I don't know. It's weird. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when it comes to that side, I don't want to venture too much into it because, again, there's only a little bit that you're able to grab onto. And still, like we were talking about before, Outlaw, like you were saying, when people get too much information about something, especially today with everybody being so divided, they come in to the conversation at Thanksgiving and they end up sounding like a raving madman to their parents. And I think a similar thing may be happening today. Like, regardless of however you may be with, uh, uh, you know, with uh, the COVID-19 stuff, lockdowns, whatever you may think is going on right now with like Trump versus Biden and all that. I really do fear that people have gotten so divided now and there's been so much information that people are exposed to that if you're not able to disseminate that information properly vetted in such a way that you don't just take everything out, but just take like the key bits that you can 100% verify and put those on. But that was, again, like that would require time. That would require energy. And we're always just taking all this stuff in. Like, do you guys see yeah. any solution And I know this is venturing away from people um, disappearing, but I think people are disappearing in a different way. I think people's souls are disappearing from this constant infighting that they're having online, Mm -hmm. that they're having in front of the Thanksgiving dinner table in a couple of days. So what do you guys think? Do you think there is any resolution here where people can grab onto things of substance while being able to discard the rest and make people all, all the better for it? Yeah, people need to meditate more. And I mean that in all senses, like you see, and this is like spiritual as well. You'd see, you know, for example, um, on a night out, you know, like you're at the pub or whatever, you'll see the people that are like starting fights or, you know, for whatever reason, they're very aggressive and like they, they, they're they always starting fights. Um, they tend to be the least secure people, you know, they're very unstable and they're very, you know, they're usually weaklings as well. It's the people who are really secure in themselves that don't take offense to things and that don't worry about, um, you know, they mightn't start a fight, but they'll finish one. You know, I find that's, you know, that applies to all of these things. Like I said, the people that get overloaded with information, it's because they don't understand themselves and they haven't taken time to meditate on, you know, who they are as a person. So they lose that and they take on this new role, like I'm Kalki or something. And that ultimately gets in the way of uh, true development. So in terms of people, you know, trying to like argue on Thanksgiving and being very divisive, it's because they just don't, they're angry and they're frustrated at the situation around them, but they don't actually really understand the internal things going on that are causing them to be frustrated at that. They don't know, you know, maybe it's a lack of freedom and it's because deep down they're a person who wants to be free um people just don't get that in the modern world and it's because we spend all day 
looking at little screens and then we go to work and look at a big screen. We go home and reward ourselves by looking at a medium sized screen and it's all just destroying our um, attention span and just sitting down in silence by the fire for like 10 minutes is almost too much for the average person. If we spend more time in silence, you know, out in these woods, hiking or whatever, we'd come to understand ourselves better and mm. we'd find no need to try and argue with someone unless they were genuinely coming from a place of goodwill, asking for knowledge. Um, it's a waste of energy. You can't change people. That's why there's no point in arguing with someone with at the dinner table. You can't yeah, change them, you know, um, but you can change yourself. And the only way to do that is by recognizing where you're at right now, what kind of person you are, your failings and your virtues and what you're meant to do in this life. So that's what I'd say. Meditate more on yourself, on your weaknesses and your strengths. I don't think, think you necessarily so. need to. I, I, I think that's absolutely correct. Uh, one thing to keep in mind with these dinner table politics, keep, just remember that the left did the whole not my president bit and they didn't accept Trump as legitimate. And now the right is doing the not my president bit and they're not going to accept Biden as legitimate. And the entire electoral process and the idea of democracy has utterly failed and nobody believes in it. What comes next? You, you can fill in the blank there, but you're not going to make any headway talking politics in real life ever mm. so don't do it ever again it's over I'll i tell you um people are so addicted i'll tell you to what it. yes we yeah I, I'll, I'll tell you what happens I'll, you know if you ask um a loved one of anybody who has um you know i mean i, mean, I guess it makes sense that i always talk about hiking but outlaw brought it up too but uh, you know if you ask anybody who's a loved one of someone who has just gotten back from a trip that where they really really push their boundaries and challenge themselves um you know be it just a a, a very long through hike that took you know several months or a, a summit attempt um that was successful finally or what have you the the one unifying thing that all of these loved ones will say about uh, about this person coming back is that they are just chill they're just chilled out you know if something goes wrong um if somebody disagrees with them they just don't really care it's it, they re recognize that it's not um a direct threat to them and they are cool with not having control over that situation and that's the biggest thing that most people don't have and i, I think it is a control thing i think that um a lot of people they feel like they have a lot of control and they do control a lot of things in their life like they can control when they can eat they can control when they can sleep and those are things that normally you're, you don't really always control you're supposed to kind of let go of that stuff a little bit a lot of the basic bodily stuff and i'm sure a lot of some of the more advanced things too like you know social media and stuff like that like you know lo higher on the maslow's hierarchy of needs or whatever uh, or you know affected by this as well but it's just a it's a matter of um having too much control and still not having true control of yourself that just traumatizes people and just like outlaw said you know meditating or just just reminding yourself that you are a part of everything else and you need to be patient and you can do that in the outdoors is how you get around it really and then what's the point of having control without understanding i mean that's kind of how i like to see it I don't know. Well, the only thing that would change is, let's say you are in some capacity, like in an organization, like a small organization, and let's say they start to get a little bit too woke for comfort, and you fear that this is going to lead to further censorship or self-censorship or whatever, then would there be, and I think if done in the right way, there would be somewhat of a benefit uh, at least for being able to sleep well at night and knowing that you at least gave it the old college try to try and as politely as possible voice certain concerns that you may have. And you could say, well, it's not going to amount to anything. Maybe it's because nobody else did it. And uh, maybe if you are the lone voice that does so, 
it could potentially reverberate around other people. So maybe people could see things in a different way. But again, it's very different than the I'm right, you're wrong, deal with it, you know, own the libs, you know, that kind of like Ben Shapiro mentality that I think a lot of people are trying to copycat. And as a result, it's only fomenting more, uh, more problems. I want to, I'm going to talk about meditation. I feel like we're, we've got like this, like, uh, duality of meditation and politics. And as soon as like we get maybe somewhere in the meditation, it immediately goes back to Ben Shapiro. I want to, I want to <laughs> learn how to meditate from one of you guys. Cause like I've tried, I've tried so many fucking times. I can and, like, teach you the breathing I think I'm just learning, but I can teach you the Wim Hof method. So for those who don't know, and everybody here already knows who's watching. And for those who don't, please subscribe. I know Wim Hof, but I've like still like, I've tried stuff like that and it never, I feel very weird with stuff like this. Cause I always get, I've, the only thing I figured out recently is to like, I still have to like ha have the inner monologue, but like I pause myself while thinking, so I like take one word at a time, and that kind of helps. But I just no, 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 no. Much. I don't know. Don't don't do that. Thoughts are always going to come. It's just a matter of letting them pass. Like the well, no, but uh, trust me, I've done that, letting them pass, and then another one comes through. Like yeah, but they'll keep coming through. It's it's just a matter of what you focus on. Um, a thought may enter your home, but don't invite it to tea. You know. You don't need to well, no, but down. the problem is that becomes, I guess that this is a product, I'm a product of, what is it, like, internet and stuff in some regards and technology, but I find that, I try and I have the will, but I find that incredibly difficult, because loads of fucking, I've got all this, like, fucking stimuli, man. It's like, I think maybe... I'm talking outside, I do this outside in nature, I took my phone off, I'm not thinking about my phone, Yeah. and it's like, I don't know. Do you want to put on one of those eye blockers? What was it called? The, uh... I use one of them. In fact, I can show you right now what it is. It was invented by Alex Gray, although you could find uh, similar ones uh, in other places. Let me get it right now. And by the way, while I'm getting it, I could still hear everybody. John, do you have any advice for Owen when it comes to meditation or letting yourself just... Uh... I, I think I have similar questions. I'm, I'm anxiously awaiting uh, more on this. <laughs> I've been uh, meditating uh, way too little uh, lately, but uh, way too much uh, earlier. And I find um, trying to focus on uh, your being, your body and uh, flesh and just uh, becoming aware of uh, every single cell in your body. Yeah, it's uh, the, the, you know, the the ultimate act of meditation um, and I have to say when I mentioned meditation before I meant in more of a vague sense not necessarily sitting down to actively meditate but um, your it's understanding your all aspects of your being all your subtle bodies and I talk about this on Outlaws Hour um, I, t I talk to people about the traditional forms of meditation compared to other ways I think when you'd benefit from visualization um doing you could imagine like a a type of a light or something washing over you and okay. it'll, you'll it's actually quite interesting you you'll feel it happen because it is happening mm. in other you know i'm not sure about your worldview or whatever but no i'm know, not particularly and... negative it's like it's yeah. just the i find it hard to relax i have so many ideas and potential but then it's just like when i want when i need to like de you know, it's, everyone needs to relax and everyone needs to get away from stuff. You know, like, you can't just have that stuff going on all the time. But I've tried meditation as, like, I think meditation is the healthiest way of doing that. But we all have stuff that we do that's maybe not, like, necessarily unhealthy. But, you know, alcohol, you know, like, media, that's our forms of, you know, meditation is probably the best way, the natural way. But I can't say that I've not resorted to, like, having a, a drink, you know, just because it like does the same thing but it does it with yeah. like a an item rather than pure willpower well there's a physical you know aspect of meditation like yeah. um, lev mentioned wim Hof method and i tell that to people um on outlaws hour it's it's a service i do where i just i just first mentioned you know wim Hof is a good way of relaxing your body um it's also the mind and it's the soul the spirit you know the astral the ether there's all these other aspects of your being that can't be neglected you know if you're meditating and trying to relax all of them all at once you'll see more um you know like it, it it'll make more sense because i was kind of like you you in, in the sense that 
practice sitting down in silence and just breathing and focusing on breath was you know obviously beneficial but it was kind of almost frustrating because it's like you're just doing nothing um but well, you have to think that you actually are doing something well, eventually, so that's why eventually well, it yeah. doesn't become doing nothing eventually what it becomes and i hope i'm speaking into the mic because i can't really see what's going on yes <laughs> pretty soon okay you know you're doing well when pretty soon you could actually do shows like this and see everything despite having this on which one day hopefully i'll be able to get to but anyway when it comes mm. to meditation at least for me i am able to get to the point when i breathe in I am able to see light, like things end up getting, you know, like uh, lit up when I breathe in yeah. and uh, so on and so forth. So you do have a model that you can look at as a sign of uh, as a sign of progression. Mm. Same thing with like seeing a light in the center, the third mm. eye, whatever you want to call it. I don't know oh, if everybody sure. has the same experience, but uh, if uh, if this is the case for a lot of people it's another way of saying like, it's not mm. just going to be nothing. You are going yeah. to be seeing visualizations. Mm. Yeah. That's, that's why I said the, vi the visualization is a good way to, you know, but just to be clear, like I'm not saying, I'm not saying visualization as in, I guess it goes yeah, back to the whole to. Apple thing. Yeah. Like you're not thinking mm. about the Apple. You're actually seeing like the electricity in your mind. Like uh, it's actually producing this visualization you know what i mean like i want to yeah. distinguish that from like thinking about you know a triangle or a dragon or whatever and just thinking about it as opposed to seeing mm -hmm. it because i think yeah, I no it's get... different mm -hmm. it's because it's an astral it's astral and your astral body is being affected by it and astral body is also you, you also have your energy body your chakras like you mentioned the third eye so yeah the light that you're mm -hmm. seeing is real and it's there and it's actively purifying your astral body the same way the air but I have breathing. to ask an important question about uh like meditation and this relates to it it might not sound like it at first but like how physically fit is everyone here in terms of like exercise because I feel like part of the reason I can't really meditate is generally when I want to do it I have all this energy that I feel like I should be spending running and it's not about I feel like doing nothing would be a potentially more useful activity but then it's like I'm almost like I should I'd get more of a meditative process out of running or doing exercise I don't know that's also meditation. meditate after yeah. running. That's oh, does that count as meditation? Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm a big fan yeah. of, of bhakti yoga and just doing everything in your life, every single action you do as a prayer. Everything everything that's bad for you that you want that you deny yourself as a sacrifice to your God and do do that knowingly. And it, it kind of, uh, it you know, focuses, focuses your being, your consciousness. And uh, I, I think... Yeah, there's a lot of ways to meditate in like running. Going for a run could be a sacrifice to your God in a lot of ways. But it oh, wouldn't yeah. be a sacrifice to me because I enjoy it. I don't know. Like that's Yeah, well you enjoy I mean, Mars, um, for example, is a deity that one of the greatest offerings you can give to him is to go out and train and swing your sword, you know? Like, oh, okay, so I can enjoy sing and it doesn't have to be a sacrifice. For as sacrifice, long as it's a struggle, you're still struggling okay. though. You're enjoying okay, the good. struggle. Okay, for, okay more that's good. Like just, the problem is I'm a lot of what I know about religion and like because a lot of you guys you've got this like interesting thing you've got this like occultism and other stuff like that or like some form you know it's like not the traditional thing my what I know about religion is that it should be shit and painful and then you do it for your <laughs> gods and then it's prayer for your god and it's like you go into church, you bore your ass off, you have to like listen to an old man you don't care about rant, and if you were to go up to him, he'd be like, I'm just doing my job, you know, the power of yeah, God from the stuff I've had. It's 2020 now. We create our own religions. Yeah, I mean, that's what I've been doing. That's what made sense. And pretty soon yeah. we're all going to have different uh, cults that we're going to be subscribing to, and you know what? With Maybe their own some... blockchains. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> cults. But, uh, but by the way, oh, one other thing with cults. the visualization that I want to outline now that I can actually uh, see is that, um, and this is a question as well for Outlaw, in case you had any experience. And by the way, John, uh, I, I don't mean to take the subject in this meditation realm, but uh, I hope that this, if you have any questions as well. Uh, well, okay, Outlaw, here is my question to you. When it comes to these astral visualizations, right now it's still something that's made up of, uh, you know, circles and vortexes made out of little circles and basically blue and purple vortexes of circles spinning around and creating three dimension, like the three dimensional structure I mentioned on earlier streams, where there's a DNA helix in the middle and there's a dome 
of all these uh, lights spinning around and you can zoom in, zoom out, but it's not like I'm seeing the world that I'm seeing around you right now. You know, like I'm not mm -hmm. seeing everything as nature. I'm seeing it in the mm -hmm. form of these abstract uh, circles, bubbles, whatever you want to call it, that are just spinning around really quickly. So mm -hmm. would you say that there is a transitional point from seeing things made up of those shapes to seeing something more and not that they are aren't complex i think they are very complex but like seeing something like this because this is very complex you can't i can't see the electrons here but i can see you know so many details all at once that aren't just a bunch of circles spinning around so what mm -hmm. do you think about that outlaw and we got chris yes. don harris here as well yeah so it's the um you know, you see things as symbols, which are like the higher higher forms. They're kind of more real, in a sense, than the what you see in front of you, like your hand. But it, it you know, we must keep in mind that the astral. When I say like the astral world, I, I'm not talking about like some concept. Like it, it is an actual world that we interact with, and it interacts with us. Uh, anyone who's astral projected before will understand. Like if you were to go to your room where you're sitting right now. Uh, after astral projecting, things will look just weird. There'll be weird things going on, and the sim, you know, things will be represented by symbols and kind of abstract um, things, like you said. So it's very much a case of the individual how advanced their, uh, you know, abstract thinking is, and like especially in dreams, if you're someone who like has this kind of affinity towards higher symbols and complex symbols, like, um, you know, stuff you'd see typically in occult circles, it's like layers and layers of symbolism. If you're able to understand that, you'll see your dreams are much more like, <laughs> you ever notice how some people would have a dream where they, you know, enter a different world and they can see like all these, you know, spirits and their ancestors and they get these visions. And then another person would have a dream where they like, go to mcdonald's and fucking you know something really really boring it's a matter of the individual has their own um kind of like archive of symbols that represent the astral world and the dreamscape as being its own dimension pocket dimension but what you were saying about meditating and seeing things uh how you said like it's not like you're visualizing it in your okay, mind here's it's... the example you can see it on the screen right now obviously it's a lot <clears> more <throat> complex looking but you see that little dna helix thing over here with the spinning lights so imagine <clears> the three-dimensional structure like this while your third eye is vibrating like a small motor and you can <clears> just <throat> zoom in zoom out and it's kind of slow like it's not you know i can't just do that like it's like yeah you know what i mean like what is that yeah. what is going on there that is i've never really yeah. read a read anybody describing that particular experience with that particular sensation so from yeah. your that's that that's um typical like you're you're viewing with your astral eyes or your third eye and you're viewing an astral thing and it's different for everyone but i had a similar experience when i was doing an exorcism where i saw the crown of thorns and I saw it very, very uh, much like the way you described it. It was like that. It was slowly turning around and the background was all red. It was very strange because I was thinking, what does this, what does this even mean? You know, what's wow. this got to do with the, the exorcism? But it later made sense, of course. But um, your intuition brings you to these things. You know, obviously you're meditating and then you're seeing something like this and what you're doing now is you're pondering it and you're trying to meditate on it so that's the purpose you're you're going to figure out what it means why it's being shown to you and why your intuition is guiding you to see this thing um it, it will click eventually you know of course when once you keep up with it so excellent very and, interesting uh, and by the way john uh, i know that it's already seven o'clock and you are so amazing sticking or sticking around with us i have chris tanti harris here so i wanted to get him to uh, ask uh, ask you a question if that's okay sure so uh chris Tan, you are from minnesota uh oh, sorry from uh, wisconsin and you have uh 
have you encountered things in the wild or uh because i know that you are very much into a lot of cryptids a lot of things having to do with uh things that are beyond the horizon and we've had a conversation about this throughout this show pretty much but i'm just curious if there is anything you would want to uh, add here and the book by the way that was written by john it is the cold vanish seeking the missing in north america's wildlands so it is about like uh you know just and again, you didn't give us a number. What is the conservative number, John? That that's allowable to say without any the problem. People are just going missing and they're just disappearing up there. Or... Hmm. Yeah, pretty much. So, John, what would be a conservative number that you would be able to say as far as at least this amount of people are missing? Well, we had some help with David Polites on this, with my my magazine editor and I, and, it, and we came up with the conservatively sixteen hundred. That's uh. That's a lot. And that's that's all time total, right? Pretty much. Yeah, I would say uh, over basically 100 years or so. But um, like I say, I think that's conservative. But when you consider when you consider the effort that goes into finding every one of the well, not everyone, but but many of those um, and the technology that we have now in that's applied to searching for people, that, that's that's a that's a big number. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, in Wisconsin, we, we have something that we have a couple anomalies that we're well known for. The first one is the Indian effigy mounds, which unearthed humans between uh, seven foot and 18 feet tall. And it wasn't just uh, one skeleton. It was an abundance of, se- of many effigy mounds uh, reported by uh, mainstream news uh, w- featuring reputable uh college professors, researchers, Smithsonian experts in many of these articles. And I've, I've actually unearthed over a thousand articles, not all from Wisconsin, but about uh, 17 or 18 different sites here in Wisconsin, all dealing with Indian effigy mounds. We even have symbolic effigy mounds. It's funny you guys are talking about symbolism, but we have lizard mounds and lion mounds. And uh, that's more of the basic thing. I think a lot of these Bigfoot sightings and things like that are just are uh, not sightings, but like footprints were just larger human beings that may have lived due to the certain ecosystem that they had a couple thousand years ago. Whether or not uh, that's the case, all we know is that there was reports uh, in abundance by major universities of these skeletons being unearthed in Wisconsin. Uh, the other thing that a lot of people know Wisconsin for is UFOs, uh, mostly because uh, Benson's or uh, Dundee, Wisconsin is the number one site the sightings for UFOs in the world is right here in Wisconsin. They call it UFO Alley. So there's been more sightings than any other place. And we're talking like floating orbs. And uh, I went out there. I didn't see anything. Uh, go figure. But uh, the location, which is uh, Benson's Hideaway, which is a notorious bar. That's where they have UFO days. And people come from all over the world to uh, partake in it every year. That's also here. Other bizarre things. I know that there's a lot of Indian folklore, shape shifting, um, things like that. But nothing um, as far as people have gone missing. Uh, the only 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 organization that might have more missing people uh, than your book is uh, Child Protection Services. So, no, the- what- oh, go ahead. Love. No, no, go ahead. No, I, I, um, you know what. The- what 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 I wish I could have gotten more into in the book and and, and a, a tremendous tragedy and uh, something that, that really needs to be to be dealt with are the the missing and murdered indigenous women in um, in, in both Canada and the United States and so um, you know you talk about the math being tricky um, off of the reservations um, the math gets really tricky on the reservations too and the numbers are just staggering. Do you think it also has uh, to do, like, I know that alcohol in general and drug use is pretty rampant in a lot of these communities, and people kind of put a blind eye to it because, like, you know, not my problem, not my culture, but uh, would you say that that also contributes to uh, some of these things happening? Sure, sure. And then and then just the, uh, you know, the, the geography, just the, the remoteness and just the vast um, landscapes that... Um, that are inherent to to those reservations too yeah well it reminds are there me. yeah s- sorry sorry Lev. are there a lot of um strange disappearances uh particularly with um indigenous women and, and whatnot who are going missing because I've, I've heard i've heard people you know saying this 
before and i you know like lev i always wondered to myself like well yeah i know unfortunately there's a lot of you know crime and alcoholism and stuff in these communities and like you know you know people women unfortunately disappearing goes hand in hand with that and you know possibly my own you know i'm just being lazy about it I, i'd never heard of anything weird and i'm, I'm just curious if like are they have are, are there strange 411 type disappearances impacting these communities even more or is it do we know much Oh boy, I, that's a really good question, and I'm sure there are some. I, I'm not, you know, I think I think Lev pretty much uh, tagged it here. Um, I think, um, you know, some of the some of the social problems um, in, inherent to some of these communities is probably the majority of them. But but because but because some of these reservations are on these, um, you know, in parts of like it's the Western United States, um, you know, just. Uh, like I say, just the, just the vast geography at play here and, um, um, you know, a big country. Hey, John, are there any legends about what has happened or where people are going missing? Not saying that all legends are true, but there's always some, usually I find uh, some truth to a legend. And so I was curious if there's any old folklore or anything like that pertaining around this uh, missing well, people. Yeah, it's interesting. And I, I, I don't know a whole lot about it, but like up here, I live in the upper peninsula of Michigan and they talk, people talk about the Michigan dog man. Up yeah. Here. The UP, the, the humongous fungus. I, I, I <laughs> so, and I'm up in Crystal Falls often. This oh, is, great. this is such a, a, a glaring tightrope that has to be walked in these cases. And sometimes it, it's so clear to me when you're talking about very real cases of women going missing and there's very real problems. And then immediately and it's it like and i'm i'm not pointing fingers at anyone it's just like it's so easy to go condo, go down like dog man suddenly and that's that's something i feel a lot when i'm especially reading david polite stuff it's like once you've written nine books or whatever and you're kind of implicating bigfoot but anytime anyone asks you you kind of just brush it off and write another book it's like how much and then once every case you brought you you keep broadening the search in every book and then how many cases need to be a missing 411 case for like all cases could just be a missing 411 case. And it, I, I'm, I guess what I'm getting at, it's just a very, very difficult tightrope to walk where it, first of all, some of these outlandish things, they are good for bringing people in to look at these cases. And that's, that's probably a good thing, but at the same time, the people get lost along the way. Could it be, uh, is this taking place in the UP, you said, uh, Upper no. Peninsula? Oh, no, no, not necessarily. There are, there are clusters up here, there are, they're, and they're in David Plays books. Um, and, I, and I'm not saying the Dogman has anything to do with any mix. I just think in, yeah, yeah. in regards to legend, that's, that's one of the, the infamous legends up here. And I, that's really not associated with anyone missing up here necessarily. By the way, well, we that. do have we do have a super chat which I've been meaning to read. Another one, by the way, three dollar <laughs> super chats. These are all three dollar super chats, and this one's from Lun or Lunay. I don't know. Wow, is that the culture barbar from Twitter.com? Always amazed at the quality of guests this show manages to get. Keep up the great work. By the way, ignore that Lore Holm guy from earlier. Uh, he is a raging. Uh, oh God. Okay. Well. Yeah, I mean, Twitter's not going to, I mean, YouTube's not going to censor this. Why not? They paid the $3, and it is not a curse word. He is a raging... $3 ho- by the chance... Oh, sorry, I interrupted you when you said the word. He is a raging <laughs> homosexual and unfortunately cannot control himself. So, there we go. Okay. Wow. Is $3 dollars by any chance the lowest amount you can donate? No, no, chat? you can do. Well, you could donate $1, but don't. Donate 3 at least. <laughs> ah, okay. Then yes. Oh. Donate 3 and by the way subscribe we've been getting a lot of subscribers from this stream i don't know subscribe if, yes now. i don't know if it's from the nordic countries but from wherever it is i really appreciate you guys are the best again like if you guys you know put in words that we cannot say you know gamer words we're not gonna say them but uh i mean homosexual i guess that's you know homosexual it's a word that everybody can say and uh, homo sapien sex yeah, exactly cool. yeah that's fine so yeah that that should be fine but anyway guys again thank you so much for your donations thank you so much for everything and uh one other thing i want to mention joey coco diaz the comedian when he was in colorado he talked about how some of his vietnam buddies talked about the best way to kill someone which is to tie them up to a tree lather them in honey and just leave them for the bears i couldn't imagine a worse 
a worse fate than that. Like, I don't know, getting eaten by a bear like that. Would that would that work though? Like, would that be enough to set the bear off? Maybe for Winnie the Pooh, but like not like. You'd Any probably have birds animal. eating you first. Something yeah, would start to take some about. some chom some chomps, but honestly, bears are bears aren't really at least black bears. They're they're that not mean, really that brave. I mean, a bear kit mauling me would be far better than slowly being eaten by like birds and insects. That's what I'd, I'd be, be more terrified about. by <laughs> ants. Yeah, ants in particular. Ants are fucking scary, man. Yeah. I don't yeah, trust chip, ants. Chip, chip yeah, two small rodents. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> But they're so cute. What what could they do? No, oh, they will steal your food right in front of you. In fact, they'll uh they'll chew through the straps on your backpack. So you could be out in the middle of nowhere. You know, you've got this one way of carrying all your stuff. You got sweat on the straps of your backpack. They'll chew right through and all of a sudden your backpack's ruined because they like Heads. to sweat. Dickheads. I'm yeah. Honest, yeah. They're the they're the gnarliest <laughs> thing. And Amon Sadhu says, our great patron, by the way, $50 patron. Amon is a $50 patron. He recently Ooh. got uh, the uh, custom wooden uh, sculpture that my father, Alexander Poliak, created. And by the way, go to patreon.com slash break the rules right now. Become a patron and you are going to get these beautiful prints from my father, Alexander Poliakov, for $20. And $30 patronage gives you a beautiful print from Giovanni Panacchetti. Here you can see him making mm. it. And it's from the TFW No GF series. So, guys, become a subscriber. Become a patron. Do it right now. You are not going to regret it. We are the greatest, most underrated streaming YouTube series of all time. And we are expanding beyond YouTube. I We have a DLive. We are going to have uh, more action on BitChute and uh, Rumble, I guess. I'm we're gonna only fans. Different. Only fans. Yes, maybe. <laughs> well, speaking of only fans, our e girl, no. our e girl stream. We are gonna have an e girl stream coming up on Tuesday, December fifteenth, and also we are gonna have a stream with Eli. Sh uh, okay, first Tuesday, December one, Alistair Crowley stream. Thursday, December three, Eli Schiff stream about uh, oh, really? fl flat art. Yes, I've been getting messages from uh, people about it actually, and this is kind of. Kind of like uh, going into the ending here. But before we get the last word from John. Oh, and we got Yakov Alive sent whatever ninja thing. What did you send there? What was that? Yeah, I'm, I was muted. I sent a ninja guinea, which is worth like a bunch of lemons. And uh, I bet, yeah, that, that's oh, a, a decent sum of money. Thank now that you. Bitcoin's at an all-time high, I think. Yeah, it's probably like like a dollar. Thank you, thank you so much, Yakov. I appreciate You're welcome. it. Welcome. And I got a couple of messages about the flat art from uh, some of the people who are not able to go. One of them said here, she said, Hi, Lev. Thank you so much for the kind words. I have no interest in taking part discussing this topic alongside Eli, as he clearly doesn't respect other artists that don't lie with his views, and I find him highly problematic as well, as the fact that you are willing to give him a platform to continue to do so. Wish you all the best. So that was one message. The other That's passive aggressive and cry baby ish. Well, okay. the other message that I got, this was better. So uh, this guy says, um, hey, love, thanks for reaching out. Glad you dig uh, some of my work. I really don't think I'll be able to take part in this, but thanks for being interested in hearing my take on this matter. If I have anything, uh, if I have to say anything as someone who works in many design related fields, it's the following. Number one, I think it's unfortunate that corporate brands have taken such a strong hold on minimalist design styles that have existed for a long time. Two, I don't appreciate artists that so openly dismiss valid forms of creative styles. It reminds me of how elitist, realist painters would react to any form of expressionism. And three, mm. it's just a trend in popular design. They come and go. We could have been having the same discussion about mid-century modernism 60 years ago. It's all good. Uh, so what I, and I don't want to focus on this too much, but just real quick, if anybody has anything that they would want to add to that, and I'd leave Good art is it. elitist. Good artists are elitist. Okay. I think. Okay. Good well, artists have a strong point of view. We will, we will take that then. And, uh, John, my final question to you is for those of us who want to throw caution to the wind and actually go out there. I know we have a lot of hikers here today. But for those of us like myself, who's very new to this, but would love nothing more than to just be outside in nature amongst the trees, would there be, you know, beyond all the, you know, survival stuff that's very important, would there be any advice that you would say constantly goes on ignored 
that you would uh, that you would give to me? Uh, yeah, I, it, analog, stay analog. Like like have a have a fancy uh, uh, satellite transponder, but don't rely on that. And um, what I've started, I've started leaving windshield notes. Like if I if I drive to a trailhead, um, I'll just scratch a note where I'm going when I plan to be back and that kind of thing. You know, text a friend where you're going. Um, I keep I keep a, a roll of uh, surveyors tape. It's just colored uh, bright orange tape in my pack. And so if I'm in a place like here in the UP, you know, um, on a cloudy day, it looks the same in all directions. It's just trees, right? So. If I'm if I'm going someplace new, I'll breadcrumb my way in, and then on the way out, I'll take the little flags back off the trees to not leave plastic in the woods. Um, but 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 get out there, you know. It's um it's great that the world is a wild enough place that um that you still have to consider um, things like getting lost. I think I think I'd hate to live in a world where 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 that's not possible. Um, and one thing too, Lev, if I if I could say, if if the book ever if, if the book ever makes a profit, which is which is questionable um i have earmarked uh 20 of any proceeds to the john francis foundation and they're over in stillwater minnesota and what they do it's a nonprofit, and and david francis lost his son john in idaho several years back and uh his son was missing for for about a year before he was found and and what happens was after the authorities after the park rangers after the search and rescue goes home for good um, this, this nonprofit steps in and tries to help families with, um, with planning, planning searches and, um, and education for people, like kind of addressing the question you just asked, you know, um, how do we, how do we embrace the outdoors when there is this possibility? So, uh, if, if, if listeners could check out johnfrancisfoundation.org, that would be, that would be cool. I am going to link to, well, I linked to the book over here. You guys could see the book. Here is the Amazon link. Please buy the book. And now I'm going to johnfrancisfoundation.org, and I'm going and to link J-O-N, that. it's J-O-N, just like my name. Oh, that's why. Okay, I gave you the mistake. <laughs> Let me do it one more time. Does anybody have anything else to add before before we conclude this great broadcast while I'm searching for the for the title? <laughs> If, if I were to plan a honeymoon one day and I want to go to a national park, which one am I least likely to die in? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Mesa Verde, the, where the, where the, um, the reinterment happened. Um, yeah, I say, you know, Grand Canyon is a good place to go if you want to go missing. That, okay, that's great. Full of, full of mysteries. <laughs> Well, there's even mines in the UP where people go missing because there's mines everywhere. And it's one of those things. But, hey, did I miss the whole conversation on the mo- the monolith that uh, appeared out of nowhere? Oh, yeah. Where, where somebody put like a looks like a, a what is that, a secret, uh, you know, ID scanner for a government entrance to underground base there? Or is that just uh, a prank or did something fall out of uh, the sky and land there? Or is it just a piece of metal? Who knows? Oh, I don't even know anymore. There are so many. So it's paper many... mache. That's what we decided. Yes, yes paper, paper yes. mache. Oh, yes. by the Swamp way, gas. I see. Okay, I see uh, some cairns over here on the John Francis Foundation site, and this is a question Buff asked earlier, which I forgot about. So, John, do you take it upon yourself to destroy the cairns when you see them? No, no. I. But they're oddly though. I see. I see them in very odd remote places you know um i don't know is, is that a i know there there has been some controversy about them i i kind of i don't know i i, I kind of enjoy a respectful karen we got um, we got to get serpent mound on here now oh man. yeah i i kick every single one i hate those fucking things <laughs> well they're supposed to be bad for the environment right like i'm not sure exactly how it's yeah, the, yeah. the ones out in the middle of nowhere are actually good for the environment if they are built for the purpose of designating a new trail um because yeah. it keeps everybody on one path um which is what like if you if you're gonna hike something like you know like on, if you're gonna go like a section of the colorado trail or something like that a lot of it's just not there yet and uh, they put cairns up so that everybody walks in one place so that you don't have, you know, an army of people trampling the ground. I'm just doing a little Karen defense here because I, I, it is kind of important, realistically. You guys were saying, like, Karen, Karen, Karen like, the annoying yes, name. Yes, I yeah. was just about to Karen. say, 
God damn it, Owen. That was just ah. I was just about to say the same thing. Like I imagine just uh, like putting these Karens up so that they guide you <laughs> in the right position. Like, chase like, really you out of the wilderness. <laughs> yeah. Or they they'll call the manager, they'll call the forest ranger, you know, if you're if you're up oh, to no man. good. And by the way, guys, everybody look at and I, and I know that John k has been kind of disgraced from the animation community because of like the sexual assault and everything. But I still think that he oh, is that a, thing? Uh sorry. Well, John K. he made a cartoon called Boo Boo Runs Wild. So I don't know, John, if you're a fan of Yogi Bear, but uh, I highly recommend taking a look at Boo Boo Runs Wild. And in it, there's this whole setup where the forest ranger, he has these rules that the animals of the forest must follow. And one of the rules is that the animal has to have one piece of human clothing on them at all times, or else they'll be considered to be naked, and that's very shameful. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a great cartoon. I highly recommend you check it out. Boo Boo Runs Wild. I think it was made for Adult Swim. So anyway, guys, this is the end of the program. I am so thankful for John being here, sharing all his fantastic stories Great with us. conversation. Definitely. And, uh, John's just, a hiking bro. And, 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 and just just talking about, uh, you know, like all these all mysteries, but at the same time, all the people that you end up meeting, which regardless of however, you know, what exactly is going on behind the mysteries, the people themselves. I think uh, it's just such a fortunate thing that we get to have characters like this in our lives and to have people uh, like Jacob's uh, father who cared so much about his son and at the same time, like, was able to open up his heart to other people just like he was doing back in, uh, like, I'm sure in Japan and then the halfway house that he built and just we need more people like that because that's really going to make sure that this world, however it goes, even if it is a... Uh, prison plan that of some sort that we're still going to have people who will guide others to breaking free spiritually speaking and i think that uh you are one of those people as well john as well as so many of the people like you guys who are on the stream right now who are watching the stream don't forget to subscribe guys subscribe. this has been great thank you subscribe. so much this Beautiful. is the end of the show subscribe thank you, we love you all take care bye-bye very well said. Right. peace